Welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Brian Beyer. Brian is the CEO of Hellbender Robotics and seems to me to be an all-around great guy. Uh, Brian, welcome to the pod. Oh, thanks, Spencer. I'm excited to be here. Excited to have you. Yeah, so I, I sort of got to know a little bit about Hellbender when I visited your guys' site, uh, I want to say like a couple of weeks ago now, and uh, it just seems like you're doing really cool stuff. I mean, you've got a PCB manufacturing operation right here in Pittsburgh which is just not really happening all the time, uh, especially for a product company, a lot of people shop that stuff out. What made you decide to go down that route? And I guess what have been some of the challenges and uh, you know, kind of things that keep you coming up to work you know, early every day? <laughs> no, that's a good question. So, you know, one of the things that we took a look at when we were deciding whether or not we were gonna bring PCB manufacturer in-house um, was really the supply chain volatility. So everybody's dealing with it right now. The, uh, especially on the silicon side, semiconductor side of the house. Um, and in sourcing the uh, PCB manufacturer, um, and specifically for us, surface mount technology type uh, PCB assembly, uh, it just gave us more control over our supply chain. So what we could do is take a look at tools, use, use things like um, you know, Octopart, and um, IHS has a great tool for uh, supply chain risk called uh, um, bomb intelligence oh cool oh yeah i mean they didn't really stretch their imagination a whole lot with the title but no. the uh that it's uh it, it perfectly <laughs> describes what it does and so that's given us the ability to um you know as you're getting into your schematic capture on the electrical side of the house to be able to understand what the supply chain is going to be able to provide and then change the plan before it bites you in the butt and then you don't have to pay for tooling cost over that's and awesome. over again yeah so, so does that does that give you like alternate components or like do you design in like empty spots on the board or what are some of the ways oh, you can have a I, I mean you nailed risk? you nailed the two big ones. So so one of the things that's that's really difficult um, for an electrical engineer or draftsman uh, to natively source is form fit function or even more so than that, direct fit components because there are a limited number of parametric searching tools for electrical components. Oh, cool. There's a couple of companies out there that are trying to uh, trying to fill that gap. So, um, you know, Bomb Intelligence is one of them. That's, that's the one that, that we use. Um, we're also trialing a, uh, a pretty exciting new product um, out of Israel called um, Aikido. Interesting. So Aikido, yeah, Aikido, they are on the right path. They're a startup out, out in- uh, They got um, a cool name. They got a great name, <laughs> a solid name. The, um, so Aikido is trying to bridge the gap between tools like bomb intelligence and sourcing tools like Octopart. And cool. actually for them, they have a native plugin with Octopart. Nice. So if you can see anything in Octopart, they have it as well. And then they do a little bit more on the, on the back end for uh, purchasing management and things like that. They don't have a lot of clients right now, but for, um, I think for folks that are, that are, you know, they're one to watch. Like yeah, Aikido. They, Aikido. Aikido. Yeah. Sorry. Actually, and we we uh, so we met them through. Um, we're trialing their software right now. Uh, like it's they're, I think um, they don't have all the features that we use in like bomb intelligence, right? And they're and they're priced competitively, but you know they're they're uh, they're trying to make it work. I really think they're one to watch because um, you know first of all, when you go to a huge company like IHS Market, they don't. They don't change and adapt to the small player. Yeah, that makes sense. Where you go to somebody like Aikido, hungry startup, like you ask for features, and then you could see on the roadmap how your feature got added in. Oh, that's so cool. they're yeah, they're very responsive. We met them through the uh, um, four one two by nine seven two. The uh, I don't know oh, so this is uh, this is a good one. So this is uh, this is an organization that. Um, was started in Pittsburgh to, after the Tree of Life shooting, um, to foster better relationship between the Pittsburgh tech community and the really vibrant, like, Israeli tech community. Oh, cool. And so the, um, yeah, the CEO of that, um, Gal Inbar, is a, is a close friend, of so course. So it was like 972, like Tel Aviv or something? Yeah, then? it's Israel. Yeah. 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 So it's, um, yeah, so that's the, that's the whole game. They're fantastic. Um, I think they've, I think they just hired their first local full-time um, uh, Pittsburgh rep. Badass. And then, um, and then Gal Inbar, the CEO, he's over here, you know, probably every couple of weeks, 
um, the uh, um, great guy always brings amazing dates when he comes to visit, <laughs> like super fantastic. But they're just trying to broker like uh, better understanding and, and business relationships between Pittsburgh and Israel That's at awesome. large. Yeah, it's it's super super cool. And um, David Carlson um, of uh, uh, formerly of Co Conan Grigsby, and I apologize to David in advance for I've met that guy before. not remembering the name of his current law firm because they got bought. Stinson. No, yeah. not Stinson. Crap. Sorry, Dave. Um, the uh, this was one of his. I think I've had a beer with him. Like I, I swear I've met that dude when he was at Conan and Grigsby. Um, he is, uh, yeah, partner of Conan and Grigsby, uh, just an all around, really outstanding um, startup universe navigator. Like uh, <laughs> you know, he's he's going to help make sure that the uh, um, that the business goes right. And um, and Amanda too. Have to give a shout out to Amanda. But this was one of the passion projects of uh, of David to cool. create this this organization. That's and, awesome. Uh, yeah, I think it's doing some good work. That's really cool, David. If you want to come on, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, well, we could probably get you Gal. We could certainly get you Gal Inbar. Who's Gal Inbar? The uh, the CEO of the the four one two by nine seven two. Thank you. No, we got it. We got you covered. Yeah, so the be awesome. Um, no, we, yeah, yeah, remind me, we'll make the intro. So, yeah, that'd be, that'd be sweet. I think I still have David's cell number, but I'd have to check, but yeah. No, dude, Holy crap, dude. I was a client and I never had his cell number. Are you kidding me? That's amazing. I, I, have to check. I might not have it. I, mean, I, I think I just scanned his business card when I met him mm. at some event, and then that's how I got in touch. So that's a savvy able. play. This is this is where the networking skills really come out. Yeah. Well, I used to not do it, and I would get these piles of business cards. And I'm still a little bit guilty. Like, I'll still have, like, a few on the corner of my desk, which I'm trying not to do anymore. Yeah. But when I have really good discipline, like, I feel like the move is, like, you do the event, and then after the event, you just follow up with every single person you met, you know. And, but, mm -hmm. again, not always great at that. I feel like the middle ground is <laughs> going to sound so bad, but to find the, the high-value contacts and just follow up with them and then throw the rest of them in, like, a, a standby bin. Right. But, you know, you never really know who's actually going to be high value, which is why I said this isn't going to sound good. No, it's a fact. Like, yeah. uh, you, it's, no, you, you really don't know. I mean, some of the better, um, you know, customer relationship manager platforms, if you happen to be on one, like, have really nice interfaces for uh, OCR. Well, that, that's great when you can find a decent one. There yeah. was one app I used to use. I can't remember what the hell it was called, but they would they would use, like, some kind of AI nonsense, but then they would send it to like Pakistan if oh, that didn't work. No, and so no, of course it would transcribe. You don't you don't want yeah. transcription on yours, or you're just worried about like breach of information. Oh, breach of information. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, but the uh, um, yeah the four one two by nine seven two is uh, is really neat. Like it's um, we've met we've met some some great companies through them. Um, you know, I think uh, um, you know a couple that come to mind is uh um polygon technologies i've heard of them yeah they're 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 in israel they're um you know kind of a little bit a little bit northeast of uh, of tel aviv cool super easy to visit um the uh omer the the ceo is uh um just super super sharp really really bright i think anyone who needs a complex electromechanical prototype built yeah. Like, and at a very competitive rate to what we can do here. That's awesome. Like, Omer's your man. Like, nice. uh, yeah, his, his team is, uh, is phenomenal. They have some really, really neat stuff there. Um, they do a lot of work for the IDF, obviously, but the, uh, um, I think the neatest thing that, uh, that I saw in their shop was a, uh, a pill dispenser for nursing homes that, would, uh, that had this huge repository. It was like a mini pharmacy. Oh, interesting. That would then distribute... Uh, and label individual envelopes. Into a cup or, okay, envelope. Cool. Yeah, and then uh, and then pull it out. So then you know for uh, for distribution delivery. So theoretically, somebody could enter in their like room number at their you know yeah. assisted living facility or whatever, and then get their their uh, medication. That's awesome. Them. Or like you find out who is the best pills, and you enter that person's room number. Oh yeah, well yeah, solid <laughs> yeah, the solid play. The uh, cheers. cheers. <laughs> Obviously, I'm joking. Don't do that if you're listening. Oh, no, but, please don't do that. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that's, that's that'd be but, bad. I mean, you know, it's funny to joke about that kind of stuff. I've seen that uh, at the pharmacy level. So, I, you know, like for filling scripts, and then I've seen it at the individual level, sort of like dispensing a person's meds. Um, right. 
But I've never and this seen is that. a hybrid. This that's, is like, that's cool. Like I, yeah. I haven't seen that that niche happen. It's yet. small enough that you know it would. It's basically the size of a commercial ice maker. So you can imagine. In some that's these, awesome. Yeah, you could have one per floor. I'm, yeah. I mean, let's be honest. Like, how many unique, peculiar meds are really being dispensed on a given floor of an assisted living facility? And then somebody's listening to this, and they're going to be like, you know, a specialist in geriatric medicine. They're going to be like, Brian. Well, actually, like, if the person's an oncology patient, quite a few. I'll oh, you know. yeah. Oh, I bet that's true. <laughs> no, I, was, I mean, well, there's, I was BSing with a pharmacist. I, I don't actually know a lot about this, but I was BSing with a pharmacist. And they were saying that like the oncology cocktails are really complicated, so that's like one of the more interesting areas of pharmacy to specialize in. But oh, again, yeah, I'm, I'm talking. This is the blind leading the blind here. I don't really know. <laughs> so, yeah, and this more, this so machine is like info at SK solutions. <laughs> yeah, this this was certainly more along the lines of, uh, um, you know, hard pill medication, you know, gel tabs, like yeah. things things like that. I mean, that seems like a great niche to serve. Um, Actually, through SKA, we, we looked into, not we looked into, we built like some early prototypes for an individual level product like that. Neat. So it was meant to pair up with an app for the, that the client already had and just be like an IoT device to monitor bas basically the patient's compliance with their medication. Yeah, are you taking your meds? It like, was way uh, simpler. It was yeah. like, you know, it just dispensed like a toilet paper roll of sacks of meds that were mm -hmm. already picked out so we didn't have hoppers of individual meds from a mechatronics perspective their version sounds way more interesting it was it was really fun to look at yeah yeah cool. it was a great cabinet <laughs> solid cabinet yeah th those guys do really good designs they have a uh uh you know i'm i'm hoping to to do something with them to work on one of their um um amr platforms nice and uh they've got some really cool stuff so yeah, amrs are fun too i mean anything that moves around Anything that moves. Yeah. Actually, recently started dating a um, medical professional, and uh, they were telling me about some of the hospital robots, and me being a roboticist, nerd, you know, douchebag, whatever, I was trying to guess which company made the robot that they were talking about. So you start throwing them out, you're like, Athon. Yeah, you know, Athon. Like... <laughs> was it Fetch? Was it, you know, That's right. was it Relay that um, Sabok is calling themselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, um, did Six River Systems ever get into uh, uh, pharmacy like I don't like know hospital them, delivery? What, what the heck are they doing? Oh, uh, they're up they're up in Boston. They're they're similar to like Locus Robotics and oh, cool. you know so it's a small EMR, lightweight packages. Um, I think that seems like a viable market for that kind of tech. I mean, I don't see why they wouldn't have. But... Gosh, I mean that that kind of tech has I think I think a, a lot of viable markets. Everybody's focused on um, was it I, last mile delivery, hospital delivery, or warehouses. Warehouses, yeah, that makes sense. But yeah. I feel like warehouses, it's like a little slight, it's a slightly larger package. I feel like that seems to do well in that environment. Well, I think uh, the, you know, I have a little experience diving into some of the warehouse marketing, and and one of the issues that you run into there is once one of the robotics companies gets established, then they try to be a part of a full end-to-end -end solution. And so they're trying to edge out and displace the warehouse management system and all of the other solution providers who are there. And there aren't a lot of players in the space right now who are using the traditional like, like installer distribution network and play well with others. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, they, they try to get their foot in the door and then take over the, the whole thing instead of... Which seems like a great way to piss everyone off. I, mean, I think they're just limiting their upside, right? It seems like, look, talk to the WMSs, make sure they've got a good API. What's make a an WMS? Off, just oh, a warehouse management system. 10-4. Yeah, so that's, that's a warehouse, warehouse IT for, uh, you know, my database of where my stuff is and pick orders. Nice. So, yeah, it's, uh, it really seems like the right play would be you make your AMR, like you, you negotiate access to, uh, to things like uh, uh, high jump. For example, like one, they're a they're a WMS provider, Got it. Okay. and they focus on small and mid-sized business. Okay. So, but I think a lot of these places, you know, and and you could look at any of them. You could look at like, um, uh, you know, uh, BG or Kiva or any of these folks. Yeah. Like, I think they want to go after the big single customer, you know, tens of thousands of units sale. So so like Kiva was a, you know, they were a supplier to Amazon. Amazon yep. bought them. They become, you Amazon know, Amazon Robotics. Robotics. Yep. And then, um, you know, then you've got places like, uh, um, you know, 
uh, Berkshire Gray and the equivalent, like just thinking of Berkshire because they're they're local and you know way too many people there. Yeah, um, well, I mean they're just tremendous. Like you know, they were snatched from every robotics that wasn't nailed down. Like I want to say like three years ago or so. Uh, they did. Yep, yeah. they did. Um, I was a victim of some some of that. Like, uh, <laughs> definitely lost some people to them. Real. And the uh, they got great people. And um, you know I, I think they're probably going after like the large retailers who are trying to catch up and then you know build presence. So they're probably going after Walmart, Target. You know these these types of retailers can't go after Amazon because they're in housing all that. Yeah, they're in housing all that, and so so you look at that and you say like, uh, you know, okay, I understand the business play because you know you make one customer sale and you sell an infinite number of units, right? Um, but those people who have the ability to buy an infinite number of units have an have a huge capacity to cause their suppliers pain. Yeah, and for drive sure. you in a race. Well, if the you're buy. if you're a single client company, I mean, or even a two or three client company, you're at the mercy of those clients. Oh, 100%. I mean, work for places, I won't say who, that have been set up that way. And it's it's kind of brutal. Like, I mean, I've, I've gone so far as to, you know, like caution colleagues against, you know, falling too far down that hole. But at the same time, you get it because it's like, all right, that's a huge win. And, you know. Right. And, and if you're trying to convince, if you had investors that you have to manage, and you're trying to explain to them like, no, we're going to take a different approach. And instead of going after the big fish, we're going to go after the small to medium sized business and make their make their lives easier so they can stay competitive with the big fish. You know, depending on the uh, um, the thesis of the investor, they might look at that and be like, um, no, <laughs> minimize your go calls, after the big fish. go after what the big doing? fish. Yeah. What, how much is the sales team going to cost me? We have to do this that's over and over. And that's over exactly again. right. Yeah. yeah. So you're telling me I could sell 10 robots per site when I go to small businesses, or I could sell 10 robots per site times 1,000 sites, like, <laughs> you know, making my trip down to uh, um, to Arkansas to, uh, sell to sell to Walmart. Like, uh, yeah. now I'm calling Sam Walton up. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, there's gotta be a way to do both that's not like overly divested, but maybe not. I mean, it seems like when you get those big clients, it just becomes consuming and you don't have the bandwidth to focus on the smaller. I think they don't have the same needs. I think the if we if we did a requirements, okay. if we did an N squared diagram, right? Like you, you take a look at it and you say, you know, all right, the needs of Walmart are X, and then the uh, the needs of the small business are two thirds like of Ohio X, or but they all, like yeah, or Pitt, Ohio, or somebody like that. Like uh, you know, we're you know, it's not a complete overlap. You know, so I don't know. It's sense. I, but I think a, a way that you could approach it, and it was a, an approach that that we flirted with um, at um, um, when I was at Carnegie Robotics, was maybe the right play is instead of trying to cut out the middleman and go directly to a Walmart or something like that, there there are many like you know middleware capability providers and warehouse management system custom solutions providers and distributors of warehouse management products if you don't want to build the sales team and do all the calls yeah cut a deal with them and get into their distribution network makes sense to me so it's uh it's just a different approach that i don't think a lot of people are taking yeah no, i mean it, it makes a lot of sense and you know i mean you'd hate to lose a client but if you did with that business model your business is nearly as new or to lay people off the same way you would. Yeah. That's right. If you lose like one of two or three. No, uh, that's 100% correct, right? Like when when you're one trick pony, you have one or two clients, like everything depends on them. You don't have a diversified client portfolio. And God forbid they acquire a company that's similar to yours, but not yours. I mean, let's, let's face it. If a lot of us like to think that, that we're inventing something new sure. and that it can't be it can't be copied, right? But the fact of the matter is like whether, you know, across engineering, like a lot of what we see is uh, mimicry and plagiarism. And it doesn't matter if you're yeah. inspired by a different industry or inspired by biology, like whatever it is. Plagiarism or homage? You know, I, I like to think of it as the highest form of flattery. <laughs> so the, uh, yeah, it's, um, I, I think, this this is something that that I was I was a little bit surprised by. We did this deal uh, like almost ten years ago now, probably, and um, 
one of the stipulations of it was that there was a list of people we couldn't work for if we if we took this job, right? Interesting. And, we'll, and we won't go into like the who. Sure, yeah, obviously, but this this was your clients clients basically. No. Interesting. It, it was it was actually a list of the 10 international technology companies that had the most cash available at time now. Interesting. And several of them were clients. And we Brutal. had to def- oh, the worst. Yeah. But the um, that's that's just to bring it back to if you have willpower and money and you're a large corporation, you can solve for X. Like if if we make the thing that's going to solve like Walmart's, you know, warehouse and distribution problem, um, buckle up. They can so if they decide that they want to solve it and you're not willing to sell, they can solve it too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That's interesting. So not to get too far in the specs of that deal, but I'm curious, was this companies that your prospective partner was considering selling to? No, 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 no. Um, was it they considered them? Theirs? They considered them potential future competitors okay, just because okay. of the amount of cash that they had. So they were trying to put up roadblocks. So they weren't able to hire you and compete that way. Correct. Okay. Correct. That makes sense. Yeah. Can I ask if you ended up going for it or... Oh, we took the deal. Okay. Let's go with the deal. <laughs> uh, you know, it was, um, if I knew then what I know now, right? Um, but the... Uh, um, Which is uh, if it had current clients on it. That's the, that's the killer. Yeah, they had current clients on it. Um, that, was, that was a real challenge. Uh, we had started to do work for, for a couple of them, and it had some a real product upside. Um, oh, thank you. No and so taking a look at that, you know, we, uh, we weighed it. I mean, it's just, you know, you, you, do the, uh, you do the trade-offs, you do the pros and cons, you talk to everybody, you understand where everybody's feeling, and, uh, and we just determined that the, uh, the opportunity was too good to pass up. Yeah, makes and, sense. And dollar for dollar, I mean, you're talking of two orders of magnitude more than the current client oh, okay, that could yeah. emerge into something, right? That makes sense. So you're, it, it's, it was really a no-brainer. Yeah, two orders of magnitude is a good amount. It's, that's, that's 100 for anyone. It's 100, time. yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a decent chunk of uh, multiplier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was probably, a good deal. I probably would have taken that, too. Yeah, if I, I like wasn't hope, I feel like I'm such a stubborn bastard. Like a lot of times, it, yeah, I mean, oh, this is why it helps to have partners and collaborators you can bounce ideas off of. I mean, yeah, she almost doesn't want to screw over a current client, but if the current client is tiny, then it's like, all right, guys, come on. Yeah, if the, I mean, the rub is if the current client is a, a, a tiny portion of your revenue um, and has a large upside. And you know you're in competition with other people in that space. It becomes a burden hand problem. Yep. Um, so the uh, we have been working on um, for one of the other clients, like uh, that we had to give up. <clears throat> we had been working on a vision system uh, for picking for a human picking to oh, cool. to do error proofing and stuff like that. And this this was back in uh, we were in we were in talks with them. We'd done a light proof of concept, and this is probably back in. I don't know, 2013, like cool. time frame, and the uh, and they had the solution now, of course. Like they they went with somebody else. Yeah, and, they and figured they, it out. And they have the thing, and and you think about the number of, the number of pickers that that company has working is greater than 100,000. <laughs> and so okay, so the opportunity there is real. The opportunity was it huge. Hand, like it wasn't in hand, right? Yeah. And so that becomes it's just a part of the equation. Yeah, makes sense. So when do you make the decision about whether or not you're going to like take the lucrative deal that gives you an opportunity to not only like, you know, kick butt at the thing they want you to kick butt at, but also provides you with uh, sufficient, you know, margin or profit that you can also expand your own internal R&D and things like that. It's very hard to turn down. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So how did you tell your existing clients that, you know, sorry, but we can't work with you anymore? Poorly. Um, Sorry. We, uh, so we negotiated some of it. So one of them, what we negotiated with the, uh, uh, with the, new, with the new client uh, was that we could still finish out our existing contracts Smart. and then take no more. 
Yeah, I think that, that's that's wise because that always allows you to see through your obligations. Ha that has to be the minimum bar that you ask for. Yeah. Yeah. Like otherwise, you're just that that d bag that took the money. Correct. And what's to say you're not going to do it to them if somebody else comes around? No, exactly. Like reputation, you, you get one shot at your reputation. Like reputation means a lot. So the, uh, um, you know, don't waffle. Like don't screw over your clients. Like meet the letter of the contractor better and be stewards of their interests. Like yeah. and yeah, if agree more. if you can't do that, then you know bow out or or find a polite exit. And in this case, the um, um, we were able to finish out like those contracts, um, and then uh, and then exit exit politely. Yeah. Did you tell them ahead of time before you finished the contracts? Hey, this is no. the last one. Okay, interesting. Oh well, and, and for their contract, yes. As soon as we inked the deal, yeah, that forced our our end. Um, we went and had an honest conversation with the clients. Smart. I think that's the only way to be. Yeah, I would Just agree. be frank, be open. Yeah, exactly. People so appreciate I mean, that. Well, plus, it's you're just going to feel Don't, like... What do you do? You're going to lead them to the end, and they're, and they're going to be like, oh, man, I want you to do phase two, and you're like, yeah, ooh, about that. About but, that. Oh, uh, oh, like, oh no, no, really no, no, no. Yeah. Like, um, I'll, I'll be right back. Right? <laughs> exactly. Like, and then you leave then the chat. bounce and, to a different state. Totally like, terrible. Father in the 30s. Horrible, horrible. Start a whole new family. Horrible human beings. <laughs> yeah. No. The, uh, no, you can't do that. You can't screw clients over. You can never right. screw clients over. Yeah. No, that's, I think that's smart. Yeah. But what that, would you have done differently if you had to improve on it? On that deal? Yeah. Just with like the client management with the existing. I, I'm sorry to zero. No, 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 no. Just interesting. Oh, no. no. So I think... So I think with that one, actually, um, when I think about it, I think we didn't push back on the uh, the bird in hand hard enough. I think I think we could have kept those clients. Okay. I think we could have carved out an area for those clients that were away from the territory. Oh, I like that. And I didn't do that, and I deeply regret that. I mean, at least you learn from it. Oh yeah, like um gosh, um yeah, now the uh, territory is very important. Like when, when you really think about what a client wants and sometimes they ask for things that, you know, certainly you have rights to negotiate anything. This is America, it's why it's awesome. Like Yeah, for sure. I love the, that. Uh, you negotiate whatever the hell you want. Yeah. Like everything's for sale. Like let's talk about it. Um yeah. but, you know, a lot of times a client feels like they need to own everything. Yeah. Like all of your work, all of your foreground, all of your work for hire, license to your background, and a restriction on the territory. And the fact of the matter is... Which is hilarious when somebody comes to an agency with that kind of deal, because you're like, guys, come on. Right. Like, <laughs> you know, I think, I think what you really want to get down to the bottom of is, you know, let's think about it from the perspective of the client, and what's the differentiator that they're trying to protect? And so that's one of the things that we're doing um, at Hellbender, is we do a lot under open source license, this is interesting to me. I remember you telling me about this. And I'm people are like, why? Why? Like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't I own everything that I pay you for? And it's like, look, you're paying it forward. Like, we're going to do this under OSL. We're going to do it under whatever. Pick your, pick your flavor. MIT, Apache, whatever. Yeah. And we do a lot right now under Apache 2.0. Yeah, you mentioned that before. I yeah. That was interesting. And we say, okay, look, like, we're going we're gonna to do this job. We're going to do 90% of it under OSL. And what that'll allow us to do is the next time we have you show up. Oh, is that being open source license? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, open, yeah, open, yeah I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, for, the, yeah, for the audience. Okay. Yeah, open source <laughs> license. So, and at the end of the day, what, what, the, what an open source license like allows you to do is it means that, really it means that it is um, not necessarily owned by anyone in particular. Like um, anyone who can get the documents has the rights to reproduce it. Like it doesn't come with many strings attached. And typically it's royalty free. Cool. And that's that's the that that's the OSL community. So so we like to tell incoming clients like, hey, we'd love to do the work. What we want to do is um, you know, we want to make the bulk of it OSL. And that'll let us reuse it so you don't own it and I don't own it. Like You've got all the drawings. You could take it to any other manufacturer or engineering firm in the future to like pick this up or solve it. You know, what does that do? It's the same as if you're a small firm and you offer to put your IP in escrow, your background IP in escrow, yeah. for them to access it in the case of your insolvency, right? Which yeah. is a technique that, that we've used before to, to get work. Um, yeah. So 
OSL accomplishes the same goal. Like they could go to a different That's engineering firm. They could go to, yeah. And then you also get to tell them like, look, the reason why we could do something. Could put a PMS, bro. We've never used that technique before. Oh, yes. Yes. Should we go on that tangent, or I don't um, want to stop you from when you were initially talking about. We can come back to it. Let's uh, let's let's go on the escrow thing for a bit. Good. Let's go on the escrow thing for a bit. So, um, the uh, so when I was at Carnegie uh, Robotics, we were um, we were negotiating a deal with an established defense contractor, and they were worried about going with a risky, brand new, six person spin out from Carnegie Mellon University. You were there when it was six people? I was employee number six. Wow. Yep. It's incredible. Uh, it was, yeah, it's a good number. Um, I was I was either employee number five or six at RE Squared too. Nice. Like back in the day. I did not know that. Yeah, I like to, I like to collect, uh, oh, let's pretend it's number six and we'll just go with my lucky number six. <laughs> so the- Six, six, six. Um, oh, well, that, that, that went to a dark place. And <laughs> so for the, uh, uh, so for escrow, uh, w one of the things that we offered to reduce the risk was we said, look, everything that we do, like that's our background, yeah. we'll put the intellectual property into escrow, including our access to the uh, CMU license for some of the underpinning technology. Okay, cool. And so what that allowed them to do is say, all right, look, if anything happens to these guys, they get hit by a train, they're like all flying to our site and like the plane goes down, plane goes down yeah. right? Like uh, Clemente style, like uh, horror, horror for everybody involved, but they would have yeah, the ability. Yeah. That's exactly right. Then they can break open the, the escrow box and get access to the IP and go to a different CM to fulfill the job. That's interesting. It's so burnt. what form does that escrow take? Hey, or sorry, does that No, it's it? just a simple, uh, so the IP could be anything. So in this case, it was- um, So it was just documents, basically. Yeah, it was documents. It was, okay. it was a technical data package. It was schematic design. It was um, some uh, Verilog um, uh, logic for the does FPGA. Does the client get to view this ahead of time or do they trust that you're actually providing- I mean, that depends, on, uh, that depends on the nature of the deal. Okay. But like in, you would have you would allow their legal team to view it for diligence purposes. To view it for diligence purposes. But you don't want engineering looking at it because otherwise it defeats the purpose. Right? Yeah. You're still trying to protect you. Makes we're sense. we're tiny. We're scrappy guys, right? Like well, to uh, stop them from embedding an engineer within legal. I guess you gotta trust people at some point. You can't do anything. You know, you yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, it comes comes down to trust. But what this allows them to do and to defend to their leadership is to say, look, we've done our due diligence. We're, uh, we know that they're a risky supplier and we're mitigating that risk by allowing them to put this intellectual property in escrow. You know, therefore, um, you know, we, uh, we have an out. So it's a technique that we've used a couple of times. That's cool. Yeah, Hellbender hasn't used it yet because we're doing the OSL thing. Yeah. So as a contrast to that, like if you're not doing the, the, okay, uh, cool. the escrow thing. Back. Oh, thanks. The, uh, uh, the uh, what, what we do, is we say let's let's keep everything open source license and then let's take the slice that's really a differentiator for your territory and your product let's make that the 10 percent that you own as work for hire and so an example might be um the uh you know maybe so hopefully for for hellbender our favorite customer is a very software savvy high level software intensive company cool. that wants to manifest their intellectual property in the form of a product, be it a robot or an IoT device or whatever else. And they also need to see them and we become a one-stop shop for that's all awesome. that. Like we'll steward their program, we'll like, we'll pull together the IP. Well, that's they're not really worried about releasing the board schematic because there are secret sauces in the software. That's right. Okay. Exactly. Cool. So the differentiator, if the differentiator's in the software, look, our hardware is good. I'll put my hardware up against anybody else's, right? Like let the software be the differentiator. And so if you're talking to a customer that is like, let's say an AI intensive, you know, IoT device. Yeah. Really, that company should be worried about building out their machine learning team and, you know, building out their deployment capability and things like that. And the last thing they want to do is hire a bunch of hardware knuckleheads and embedded software guys. It's we a are a totally different group. We are a lot. different, different beast. culture. So yeah, different set of challenges. That's exactly right, and and that's what Hellbender does. So like Hellbender, we're like we're your we're your outsourced like hardware and embedded software team. We're gonna make your problems go away. We're a one stop shop. We've got great connections with industrial designers. I think actually, 
think I'm wearing my Duramo design t-shirt. Do you know these guys? I do not, but I'm interested. Yeah, check so check this out. See if the see if we get that. Nice. So so Chris uh, Chris Duramo, uh, very good, very good friend, um, and uh, uh, full disclosure, an owner of uh, of Hellbender. Um, awesome. So he has recently branched out and created um, his own industrial design firm. Cool. So he was a member of Carnegie Mellon University's very first industrial design graduating class when they first. That's awesome. That. All my friends when I was getting my robotics masters were in the industrial design program. I'm kind of contrarian, probably to a fault. We're like, I'm like, I'm not going to make friends with the roboticists. I'll get to know the industrial. I'll go designers. hang out with the ID kids. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so he was recruited out of mechanical engineering and into the inaugural like ID class, and he's That's been awesome. an adjunct professor there for for years. When did he graduate? Like approximately, just to know how long. That oh my God, I think I think he and I are the same age. So, um, Chris. I'm I'm very very sorry. Like I'm I'm probably gonna get this wrong. I'm gonna guess he's he's right around like uh, class class of two thousand ish. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's all that ID has been around for is only. Wow. That's it. That's into okay. So in its current form. When I, when I was, I want to say I was twelve years old when that year came around. Yeah. <laughs> right to date myself, mm. and um, I remember listening to NPR with my dad and um, Tom Kelly from IDEO came on and was yeah. talking about his book. He was releasing, it was 2000, 2001, it was called The Art of Innovation. And I read that as a, as a 12, 13 year old kid. And it Not really, really- Not a normal really, book for a 12 year old to read Spencer. I was a fucking nerd. <laughs> I read that, I read um, How to Influence and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Oh, classic, um, everybody's read that. Right, but, I, but if like, you don't as, read that as, by as 12, 12, 13 If you don't read that by 12, like yeah. what are you really doing? Like, yeah, you want to be the most charming <laughs> kid in high school. <laughs> The middle school I was aspiring. I was a total nerd, but like <laughs> I was trying. And so uh, between you know some of the things that I, I was reading then, I mean, it, Tom Cully's book really left a mark on me. Like I remember, just I've never gotten a design degree, but it's one of the reasons I, I sought out the designers and I, I found that mentality interesting. Was just you know, as engineers, it's so easy to get into this kind of. I mean, forgive my vulgarity, but this masturbatory loop of just making stuff that's fun to engineer, but not right. really useful to the market. And so, you know, I, I feel like there's there's a beauty in, you know, like kind of sobering up a little bit and saying, okay, what do people actually want to interact with? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think that's what results in better products. No, I, I would I would agree. I think the, uh, you know, a similar book for me was... Um, Gosh, and I forget the author, so I, I apologize. Like, but the um, um, uh, the design of everyday things. Oh, cool! I've heard good things. I don't know that I've read it yet, but I've heard really good things. Oh, it's it's fan. First of all, um, well, I think one of the things that's that's neat um, is that it spawned a whole bunch of art. Cool. About everyday things that just wouldn't work. So like like a tea kettle where the spout and the handle are on the same side, <laughs> right? Which is like the cover of their latest edition. That's interesting. Um, and, and so, you, you know. You could, but it would suck to use, I feel it, like. Yeah, like that. Like that, it would go, it would just be really unpleasant. Right, so, so there's all kinds of great anecdotes and rules in that book about how not to wind up with that as a product. Like, and that's what's really powerful. But what's fun is just the, uh, the photographer that the, author teamed up with to make the and photographer artist that made all these ridiculous impossible to create things that were examples out of his out of his head and out of his book yeah. like boy like that art exhibit by itself like is like it just sounds amazing like fun. I mean, amazingly good there's like you know a where that's at well there's a companion book that's just like photographs of all the all the stuff that the guy did that's, i want to see the exhibit now though and uh, yeah, no, the stuff the stuff is just wild. Um, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but my parents live on the same block as the Cooper Hewitt Museum in, in Manhattan. Oh, very cool. And so my dad and I went recently, uh, recently a couple of years back. Maybe mm -hmm. it was before the Pendizzle, so it was like maybe like 2019, 2018. Mm -hmm. But we went, and I want to say that. Um, <laughs> so we had this game we invented on the spot, and it was really really fun. Where I would try to guess what the thing did by using my domain knowledge faster than my dad could read the plaque. Oh. And I beat him about 70% of the time. That's pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. There's, um, there's really something about, and I, th I think maybe it goes to like the, you know, the engineer and completionist in all of us. Um, when, 
you know, when a book has like good formulas, good diagrams, like good art, like it's just, it elevates sure. the, the product. Um, and the thing that just keeps coming to mind over and over again as this, uh, this just above everything else that I know about book is, um, have you ever seen the, uh, the collection, uh, the book series called, uh, Modernist Cuisine? Oh my God. I love that. I haven't read it, but I, I've, I've skimmed it. Uh, my buddy Wayne Dudding has a copy. Um, he's one of the retired colonels I was talking about. Oh, very about. cool. And um, I think he got it like for way less money on prime on warehouse deals because it was ding. But um, it's so cool. They, they will like cut pans and yes. half with food inside. Of yes, them. like uh, the uh, the the artwork and diagramming is yeah. just amazing, and it is a traveling art show. Yeah, like I didn't know you were into cooking. That's awesome. The um, no, I'm into books. I'm into health. <laughs> I'm actually not into How cooking. How the fuck did you open up Modernist Cuisine if you're not into cooking? That is like a $500 book or more. The uh, So I bought... Um, uh, have you had uh, uh, Jake Paniculum on the on your pod? Not yet, but I would like to. So um, so Jake is the CEO of Main Street Autonomy here in cool. Pittsburgh. I know Jake. Okay, now that you mention what he's doing. Yeah, good dude. Great dude. Yeah. And um, I've cooked with him, actually. Of course you have. So I've cooked with him and his two business partners in their house on Main Street. And uh, yeah, so uh, so Ben ben and Isaac, yeah. like, and, yeah, and Jake, the, the original three of Main Street. And they've added a fourth. That's great. Um, I'm glad they're doing that. Uh, Ethan Ede, who's, uh, you know, one of, one of my best friends. I have not met him yet. I would like um, to. The... Uh, oh, well, we had, we had, you know, we had talked uh, earlier this evening about um, ARMS... Chief Financial Officer Louisa Michaels, who yeah. was the controller of Carnegie Robotics, um, and the uh, and through through her I met Ethan, cool. and um, uh, big brain, I think nice. top three brains in Pittsburgh. That's awesome. Um, it's but, a bold statement. Yeah, it's uh, he could back it up. Right. He could back it up with his biceps, but his, <laughs> uh, but his brain is even more impressive. But That's the cool. um, so the Main Street guys like uh, Jake, Jake, Ben, Isaac, and and Ethan. Um, yeah, the, uh, uh, before Ethan joined them, um, wild tangent, like, uh, I was over at their house on, on main street and we were just swapping banter and talking about, you know, like things, things to do as a business and, and stuff like that. And, um, and they were going all out, um, with the, uh, with the cooking, because as you know, since you've cooked with them, that's what they do. Yeah, I mean it's fun. It's, it's a little bit experimental, like a very. Uh... We had a good time. Um, I mean, I, I consider I actually considered being a chef as an alternative to being really? a roboticist. Yeah, and so for a few years of my life, that was like my primary creative outlet was cooking. And so I found this piece of paper in a storage unit when I was twenty that was like software engineer, roboticist, sushi chef, you know, like business owner, <laughs> and then like something else I don't remember. And it was pros and cons, and you know each of those jobs and obviously it's kind of all got mushed together you know as i enter into my 30s you know, as an old man but, oh that's all good oh, yeah. the, um you know that's the that's the crew that turned me on to uh modernist cuisine of course cool. i think they have the full encyclopedia i bought the uh single standalone which i think is only like 200 dollars. Nice. um but when you look at that product that particular book set like the 200 hundred dollar modernist cuisine book set or whatever else um the uh, um, there's the book which has a bunch of excerpts from, you know the, the multi-volume series, um, but then it has this recipe book, and the recipe book is um, is made on this uh, super special knot paper. Knot paper. Yeah. What the hell was that man? It's um. It's like it's like a. Uh, a stain and water resistant vellum interesting smart and it's on a binder so you can just have it flipped open and yeah. not take up a lot of space you on wipe the counter it down. and you can wipe it down you could yeah. highlight it you could write write on it with an alcohol pen cool. you could take notes and just clean it up and so when we're talking about like like good product and things like that like here you have this book modernist cuisine it's got these amazing you know diagrams it has the uh like is it wasn't it the passion project of of a tech mogul? I don't know. 
but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, that's that's one of those things where it's like, gosh. For some reason, I thought it was like a, what the hell was that guy's name? There was one of the one of the um, the Godfathers of molecular astronomy. Um, Herb this? Uh, I don't know if that's his, but the, hmm. somebody I thought could of. could be could be. I I thought I thought this one was a passion project of of another engineer, which explains a lot of like the cutaways, but maybe that's just my mo romanticism on. No, on you might be right. right. And I'm a, I, I actually don't know who wrote that. Like I, I, I don't have that knowledge. But regardless, that. like the product is just amazing that it's you have this, ass. it comes in this beautiful box that has those two things, but for the thought that went into that recipe book. Yeah, for sure. Just the, the design of the physical. Because most people, thing. when you buy a recipe book, they're gorgeous, right? And you're like, for how a moment. They, yeah, for exactly until you make something with it. My so like, what's your dirtiest at the point of sale? Th at the point of sale. So what's your dirtiest, disgusting, crudded up like cookbook Joy of that you have? For me. I, and that was how that was what got me into it. Um, I, I basically stole a copy from one of the kitchens at one of the boarding schools I went to in mm -hmm. high school, and I read the thing cover to cover like it was pornography. And I fantasized, the food wasn't very good there, so I fantasized about the recipes in the cookbook, and I would get really good at, like, imagining... But they had this resource available thing. to them. Correct. Well, and I still have that copy. And That's so, cool. yeah, and, and I've cooked so many recipes, and I, I started convincing them to let me go in the kitchen and cook. And so, after a while, I, I became very... People were like, oh my god, Spencer's really good at this. And so... I got. I kept getting invited back in to do it, and so that's that's why oh, I was fun. considering being a chef. Is when I was getting all the validation from that. That's neat. Thanks. The um, yeah, I think there's there's a big thing about like how how disgusting your cookbooks are. You should be <laughs> able to pick out what your favorite cookbook, your go-to cookbook is by just like just looking at the how, on how it. dirty it is, yeah. right? Like, is it stained? Is it, you know, I mean, unless you're a baker because they're just a meticulous different bunch. Wow, it's like a I different mean, crowd. Still, like, you get some baking soda and flour on a thing. I mean, that's gonna... Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, so I used to do a lot of like deep frying and shallow frying. Like when I, I went through a phase for maybe like four months, I gained about 40 pounds. And um, <laughs> I was like trying to get like the perfect tempura and like, the perfect, you know, beer batter and like the perfect, like I was just, you know, I, what I'll do when I, I get obsessed with a recipe is I'll, I'll just dive all the way in and I mean, I'll, I'll do this with engineering work too. So like I, I recently was made it my goal to learn all about like anodization and Cerakote and like a few other surface treatments and mm -hmm. all those were their own tangents. But I mean, when I was going down anodization, I called up, so I first, I'm trying to think how I did this. So I, I feel like what I did was I um, I thought about it. I'm like, who's gonna have the best knowledge in anodization out of anybody around? Probably Alcoa, because they made like all of the world's aluminum for a hundred years, and they're right here in Pittsburgh and very accessible. And they just fired a whole bunch of people, so that means that these folks are looking for stuff to do or retire. But probably even if they're retired, they want something to do. And so I started going through LinkedIn and just thinking about who do I know that used to work at Alcoa. And I thought of like four different people. I'm like, I'm gonna call those people up and ask who they know that knows about this. And so I just went, I think in some cases it was like three or four degrees of separation, but I just kept going down the line and brute forcing, you know, like it's, it's like, a, like a map search basically. And I was, um, you know, like explore versus exploit, I was exploring. And so I, I was just trying to figure out like, you know, who, who can build up my knowledge the fastest of this and also maybe join the team. And so I, um, I ended up with this guy, uh, his name's Al Laskin, he's great. Um, and he had worked at Arconic for 30 years, which is Alcoa's technology research center. And they handled surface coatings, um, among other things. And at one point, I think there were like 3,500 people. They went back down to like 100. So they, they really severe attrition. Um, and you know, it's a whole story as to how that happened that I don't fully understand, but I've heard from a few different people that were there. And um, basically, um, you know, so anyway, so um, I talked to him who I ended up hiring that guy and then there were a few others. So there was this guy that came up, uh, they called himself Captain Corrosion. His name is Maidu, he was from Estonia. <laughs> and it's hilarious, right? But I was just looking at anodization guides and he wrote like the most comprehensive guide I could just find for free on the internet. So that guy, I got on his calendar and talked to him a bunch. And then um, I found out about um, Al through, I think it was Jen Giacondi, 
who's like a high level like upper manager at the Arconic Tech Center, who was like his boss's boss there, I think. And then there was this lady, maybe it was just his boss. And then there was this lady, June Epp, who was a service scientist. And then a few other people that made the connections, but I mean, it was just fun diving into that world. And I found this 1200 page book that was all about like anything you'd ever wanted to know about anodization. It was like the surface coatings of Illumina. It was pretty dry. And I read a little bit of it, I skimmed it, and I, my biggest takeaway was I'm a fucking moron. Like, I don't know nearly as much as these people about this, as these people that have devoted their entire career to nothing but anodization. I mean, you know, and so it was a whole world. I mean, with cooking, I feel like it was similar. Sorry, that was a major tangent. But with cooking, I feel like it was similar. It's like, how the hell am I going to make the best Mao's red braised pork that's ever been made? And let me just keep going and trying this again and again and again. Like I analyzed parts on my own when I was trying to learn that. And I just, again, and again, what went wrong? Oh my gosh, the part burned here. Okay, how did we fix that? What caused that? Was it electrical? Was it acid? Was it this? Okay, it turns out it was electrical. Okay, so we need to turn on the current. Okay, that fixes that. And yeah. And so, I don't know. Sorry. It's a, again, no, I mean, it's, it's, very, it's, it's very like dial in the recipe, understand. I think that's the difference between being a good cook and a chef, right? Is like a cook can follow a recipe. A cook can follow like the, you know, just like a technician, you know, at an anodized house can, you know, knows how to set up their equipment and run their mix to get their black anodized or their red anodized like perfect, right? Or their gold aladine, whatever they're doing. Yep. Like, but doesn't understand why, right? And it, and it feels like that's the difference between like a cook and a chef where a chef is, is more of an engineer yeah. or an early technologist who like, Oh, it burned. Yeah. So let me dial up the uh, the, the current here, yeah. and um, I think that's the difference between, you know, excellent, like home cook versus short order cook versus like chef. Do you know what chef actually means? No, what's yeah. chef mean? Chief. Chief. Like they're in charge of the kitchen. It's like the the manager, the people manager. That just feels like lazy writing. It's like <laughs> chef to chief. Like, like we're one letter chef off. Chef de cuisine. Chef like, de cuisine. Uh, it's the chief of cuisine. No, that's, um, yeah, it seems so obvious now. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's the brigade system is, is like the French ranking system for like kitchen hierarchy. And so that's what they teach in culinary school. And I've never been, but I, I have a bunch of friends that have. And it's just, it's a whole world. I mean, Anthony Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential is a really interesting book about yeah, that. Yeah, I read it. Yeah, You've read it? Excellent. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And his Les House cookbook is excellent. I haven't read that. Okay. Oh, good. it's um that that actually makes um, uh, yeah. Look, I can't even like follow those recipes well. My my wife is an excellent cook. Cool. Um and the uh, um, yeah, and that's that's something that like she dives into and executes very very well. Um, that's awesome. I'm a little wilder in the kitchen. Like, well, I think I think you start. It's like jazz. I mean, this is gonna sound so pretentious, but you start with the standard. That's the recipe that you read, and then you riff and you come up with your own take on it. And you make it better. Right. So. Uh, but it's like design. Yeah. You know, so it's it's very very similar. I completely agree. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. For sure. Sorry, I sort of dominated that part of the conversation. I didn't. Oh, mean good. To. You're, you're the guest, and I feel bad now. <laughs> no, not at all. You, you went to Carnegie Mellon, I take it, too. I didn't. Um, I am a non-traditional member of the Carnegie Mellon alumni. Sweet. Um, so, so my way into robotics was a little bit different. I'm interested. Did I tell you the story? I, I don't know that you, you might have kind of touched on it, but I'd like to hear it. So, um... You know, so so the way that the way that I got into robots and into the Pittsburgh robotics community and Carnegie Mellon, um, the uh, um, I was uh, an active duty infantry marine. Cool. I was just back from Iraq, and my unit was just back from Iraq, and uh, and we had um, the uh, um, you know not so wonderful distinction, um, the president presidential unit citation says otherwise. Um, of of being the uh, the most bloodied ground combat unit in Fuck the invasion me, of Iraq. Oh, it's it's a uh, it is what it is. Proud to serve. And so we were in uh, several battles, including the the bloodiest urban battle since like Way City, and until Fallujah. 
and that was uh, Nazarene on the invasion, March 23rd of uh, 2003. And so, um, you know, when our deployment was over and we rotated back to the States, which of course, instead of flying back, um, back in the old days, like two decades ago, they decided that they were going to put us on boats, float us back <laughs> to the States, Unless fly in psychologists, do a bunch <laughs> of surveys, right? Do they Talk do that on the boat or like when oh, you... Yeah. Okay. That's oh, they're hilarious. flying people on and they're doing the interview. This, so this is like helos oh. or like how the hell are they? Oh yeah, helicopters. Okay, yeah, helicopters. So the um, oh, you're gonna you're gonna love this. So um, total tangent, right? The um, so we're we're floating back. It took us eleven days to get through. <laughs> from it took us a listen. No, no, no. Hold on. It took us eleven days to go from Moorhead City, North Carolina, on the way to Kuwait Naval Base. It took us eleven days. That's eleven days. It's across the Atlantic, down the Med, through the Suez, through the Red Sea, around into the Persian Gulf, all the way up, park and get off. It took eleven days. Getting home took fifty-one days. Holy fucking shit. 51 days? 51 days. What, the, what kind of route did you take, or did they just intentionally go slowly? Well, I don't want to blame it on the Navy, but the I was on the USS Gunston Hall for that float back, and the captain was um, Captain John Walker. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm dead serious. I can't make this shit up. Like, uh, I'm dead serious. Um, there's there's so much to dive into here. Um, That's hilarious. And the, uh, you know, we're... Anyway... One of the things that the Navy is exceptional at, and I, my, my uh, tax burden appreciates it, is they are so <laughs> good at finding combat zones and finding the boundary that establishes a combat zone. Because did you know that if you set foot or you pass through the boundary of a combat zone for one day during that month, that set whole sale. month is tax free? <laughs> Wait, what? For a service member, if you just pass through a combat zone on one day of the month, that month's income is tax-free. Okay, so the day you leave the combat zone is the day that the timer starts to thirty days from having. No, to pay the tax beginning of the end. next month, right? Okay. I mean, they're okay. not okay. they're 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 not they're not that level of penny pincher. Got right? it. Um, and so uh, so we had floated up the Adriatic so that we could be off the coast of uh, Bosnia on our, on a ready alert, quote unquote, you know, and and reset our clock and then. <laughs> You know, but they were flying people on and doing surveys because, let's face it, I mean, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the element of the U.S. military that's in combat the most frequently is, is the Marine Corps because yeah. we, we end up doing all kinds of like little brush, brush fire wars and stuff like that. Um, and I mean, to that, to that matter, um, like, uh, you know, a very close personal friend, my platoon sergeant at the time, he just recently retired as a, uh, as a gunner um, from the Marine Corps, um, uh, Chip Snyder. Like, that guy had three combat action ribbons before we invaded Iraq. Wow, ow. Yeah, um, Liberia, like uh, Neo for the embassy. Liberia, <laughs> Neo for the embassy two years later. <laughs> one with Tutu and one with, I'm sorry, Chip, I can't remember. Um, the, uh, uh, and then, um, you know, <laughs> the uh, probably Chip, Desert Storm? Was that was that the other one? Like, uh, was that was wow. that the spread? Like, uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, he was like a first-term Marine Desert Storm, then two to Africa combat combat tours, like, in, in Liberia, and then uh, and then Iraq. Gosh, when he retired, he had, like, I don't know, like five or six. I mean, you're talking about somebody who spent uh, a significant portion of their adult life, yeah, you know, in, in combat. Um, you know, but the, uh, um, yeah, we just have a, a lot of experience with that. And so a lot of folks were coming on and, we just had, I just remember a lot of surveys, a lot of questions about, you know, things like that. And then they started up some classes that we had to take. And, you know, I was a very young sergeant at the time. Um, and, um, you know, so I'm, I'm in this class called, uh, for all the married Marines, called Returning the Intimacy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is... Oh yeah. That almost sounds like a little bit condescending, which is why I'm gay one. Doesn't it? Right? Yeah. Like and and so I mean, you know, we've been in combat and everything else and uh and, and seen seen and done horrible things and um the uh you know, and there we are and I'm role playing with uh with my good buddy, um, Mike Chase, who's this uh you know, I don't know, he's this, you know, 
Is he like, playing your wife, or was this a different? Oh, we were we were rotating. Okay, you know, cool. if if you ask Mike, um, who's uh, you know another New Yorker, right? Nice. Um, I think Lower East Side. Um, probably getting that wrong, Mike. But um, okay. yeah, like uh, I'll bet he would say that I was the wife. You know, but, but, but my memory my memory is quite different than that. Big big donkey Irish, right? Like huge dude and. Um, Great machine gunner, <laughs> superhuman being, like one of the best people on planet Earth, and like just huge and intimidating. And he's leaning forward and he's like, "I'm listening to you." And it's just like, <laughs> it's amazing. like I don't, I, don't, I can't do this anymore. Can't take this seriously. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, it was uh, yeah exactly. So um, yeah, what the hell were we talking about? Uh, oh, getting go uh, going to CMU. Yeah, so, um, that's hilarious. So, so we got so we uh, so we get back from from Iraq, and um, you know the staff in, like, the the staff in our in our unit was in high demand. So, you know whether that was with uh, Marine Corps Warfighting Lab or the Marine Corps Historians or just doing debriefs and an Intel debrief and Intel debrief, um, or asking us to go and be instructors at. At different things so that we can the marine corps does a great job at corporate knowledge of like imbuing what you just learned into the next next generation right awesome. like so the uh, um for me like i was um uh i was terminal which doesn't mean that i was dying of anything it just meant that like i was i was going to transition like out of the marine corps yeah, that makes sense. and the uh so i was i was staying behind in, in my unit and helping get everybody ready and the, uh, um, the Office of Naval Research and Marine Corps Combat Development Command brought a bunch of prototypes down to my unit to try out with you know, a bunch of combat vets and some field exercises. And they were um, prototypes of this thing called the Gladiator Tactical Unmanned Ground Vehicle. So this is a combat robot. It's a machine gun toting one ton armored tracked mini tank Jesus. right and um yeah, sounds formidable it it was awesome and they uh and there was a wheeled one and a tracked one they were built by um uh keith foslin uh the late keith foslin um of uh amr deck he was a government employee cool. down at amr deck in huntsville and he had made those and the uh and so that's it's, cool that an r deck put that together because you normally think of that as being something like you know like the northrop grumman or a, a kinetic wood ship but right. So when you do really early prototypes, a lot of times the early prototypes are done by the government labs. Cool. And so uh, MR Deck had a great reputation for doing autonomous and tele-operated Humvee retrofits and stuff like that. So so the same group like made these made these two fighting robots, and the um, um, they they brought them down to the unit. We went out to the field, and the staff that was surrounding them. Um, wanted a bunch of privates to train as like operators and then they used them in a field up blah 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 um, and so the uh, uh, they were completely ineffective and the privates the robots or both uh, both okay. the, the combination thereof so um, now we're in what's called an admin is, is a field up is that like a, an exercise or yeah it's an exercise okay, it's an on. exercise so the um, anyway um those, you know, single robot to single operator pairs were getting attached out to different platoons, and they were trying them in different experiments when we were doing this uh, training exercise. And so I was the weapon, acting weapons platoon sergeant, which was really behaving more of a provisional rifle platoon because we were in an admin reset, a whole bunch of stuff that jarheads listening will understand, and that everybody else will be like, that was Greek. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway... So uh, we were doing a, a night attack on a dug-in position that was being protected by these robots. And um, uh, we smoked them. We nice. came up with a plan. I saw them during the leader's recon. We came up with a way to attack them. Because at the end of the day, like my particular... You could laze the vision, I would think, just with a good green uh, You know, but that's going to give away the fact that you saw them and knew about them. I and then that's going to put everybody on alert. So instead, I took a different approach. And what, what, uh, what I had the... the the platoon do was I looked at the uh, camera locations and predicted what their fields of view would be and I and I attacked it because I, I'm a what's called an assaultman so that's an anti-armor anti-hardpoint infantryman oh, yes. so I attacked it the same way that I would attack a tank dug cool. in Very and cool. so you know rather than looking at their vision blocks and where their commanders independent viewers looking like I was looking at the cameras 
And I was like, okay, nice. this is how we're going to go at them. And then we're not going to blow them up. We're just going to go to the machine gun and we're going to take the, the rounds off the feed tray. So we're just going to disarm them. Was that just because it was uh, Marine Corps property? You didn't want to fuck it up? No, it? no. It was, it was just, just I didn't want to give thing. away. Okay. I didn't want them to become assets that oh, hurt us. Oh, oh, oh. So because if you did that, they wouldn't even know that you had found them out. That's right. Okay, that's... that's and then I planned a night infiltration, which is where you plan to penetrate through an enemy's, like, uh, um, you know, sentry or SPOP line. SPOP? Um, uh, sentry position, Got observation okay. position. And the uh, and position. then okay. and then and then get into the trench from the flank and then run yeah, the trench right. Sense. So the um, at the Fun end of the day, the we we totally did that <laughs> and uh, um, smoked the robots and they didn't understand why they weren't firing and stuff like that. And then awesome. we're in the debrief, we're in the AAR, the after action review, and I'm just walking through all the stuff that they weren't doing right. And at the end of the day, the this. Uh, um, this uh, at the time captain, um, and he has uh, definitely gained rank since then. Uh, Robert Parks, who was with Marine Corps Combat Development Command, he was like, uh, Sergeant, what didn't we do right in the employment of these assets? I was like, Well, you're not treating them as a as a weapon system. Like every wep every weapon system in the Marine Corps that isn't a rifle is a crew served weapon, and you build up a capability around it, and so you have a squad that operates that system, and you violated that core concept of the Marine infantry and weapons organization by taking what should be a crew serve weapon and making an individual weapon, of course it didn't work. You didn't have a sergeant informing the platoon leader of its capabilities and limitations. You didn't have support protecting it, like you weren't covering it by observation. Like there are all these things that you would do on the weaponeering side of the house. Yeah. And the um, um, and then uh, as the story goes, apparently I was a bit of a pain in the ass as a sergeant <laughs> and the uh, uh, guilty. Um, but Frank, uh, what, do, what do my last fit rep say? Offers Frank and open opinions, even even when um, uh, even, <laughs> even when not requested. And the, so um, the next thing I know, I'm attached uh, temporary additional duty, temporary duty um, to Marine Corps Combat Development Command on this program as a subject matter expert. And so the uh, um, on the rest of that field op, they said build the crew. So I built a crew around the weapon and then we kept running them in operations. And then we went from there to going out and doing live fire exercises with them, um, which, uh, you know, to date, I believe were the earliest live fire with troops, like downrange under overhead fires fired yeah. by a robot um, in, uh, um, in a training environment using live this rounds. this been like roughly in terms of year? This was 2000 and this would have been uh, 2004. Cool. Late okay. 2003, early 2004. Um, and, um, and then from there we went out and did a combined arms exercise in 29 Palms, California, um, where we did uh, um, a company level assault range. We fired, we fired uh, APOBs, which are an anti-personnel obstacle uh, breaching system. Interesting. Um, so it's a, it'll cut like uh, landmines and wire, right? Okay. And basically it's 108 frag grenades connected through a hose with, with debt cord, detonating cord, yeah. fired by a rocket, drugged cool. by a parachute, and then it lays out and then it blows. So it's like a mick lick, it's a breaching charge. Yeah. And so we fired two of those live with troops, cool. troops undercover, and then went and did, uh, did a um, support by fire position live fire with troops moving under overhead fires and was this um, like I'm, I'm sorry just to make sure i'm following was this to counter the robots or was this on the same team as the robots no this is this is the robots did those the okay. robots shot those that's awesome and uh because normally that would be done by guys like uh, yours truly which let's face it carrying a 65 pound backpack of grenades <laughs> with your buddy who you need two backpacks to make one system Running that all the way up to um, where you think the minefield starts, um, which also has wire and is always covered by observation and fire, so you're you're under fire. This isn't a good way to uh, make retirement. Yeah, it makes sense. It's a good way to get, get your SGLI killed. paid out. That's right. Yeah. So the um, you know expected troop survivability is really really low, um, and so to be able to have um, a robot do this 
really establish this is a this is a dangerous job. It is still a dirty job, right? Um, uh, not dull, uh, <laughs> but two of the three Ds ain't bad. And yeah. you know, having this, uh, what it allows you to do is it allows um, a young unit leader, um, you know, like fresh out of school, to be more audacious in their decision making and take a little bit more risk, gain contact and maintain contact with the enemy. So the, uh, so anyway, that program, um, that was the, that was the army and Marine Corps side of it for the prototypes. And then there were two contractors who were working on the next generation prototypes for the office of Naval research, um, which was, uh, that program was being run by uh, Jeff Bradle, who's still at ONR, like a fan fantastic human being. Um, and, a, and, a you know, um, uh, like and I think uh, uh, just a tremendous, tremendous guy. Um, the uh, that those two were Lockheed Martin out of Fort Worth, Texas, and Carnegie Mellon University's National Robotics Engineering Center here in Pittsburgh. Cool. And the uh, so I started getting paid to make trips to the two contractors to offer them input on their designs as a subject matter expert. So we made this trip out to uh, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth earlier, um, and it was nice. Like we stayed in uh, in a great hotel right near the um, um, Texas Rangers Stadium. Good running, good running loop, like easy, easy five miles, and um, great honky tonk bars. Like uh, cool. Fort Worth, Fort Worth's great, very flat. It's and not, I've not been there yet, but I love Nashville's honky tonk bars, and I love Houston, Austin. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it, like uh, like Dallas has a has a pretty lively pretty lively music scene there. That's um, cool. And the uh, so we were there um, at Lockheed Martin, and it was easily to to date like like a, a really awe inspiring, sophisticated like engineering institution. And they didn't give a single fuck about what I had to say <laughs> as an infantry sergeant. Brutal. It was fine. Um, you know, I they, mean, it must have still sucked to come with a bag of ideas and have none of them be received. Yep. They didn't hear a single one of them. Um, the uh, we didn't get to see a prototype while we were there. We sat in PowerPoint, um, provided feedback. Uh, you know when people take notes, and yeah. the uh, so I ate bagels and drank a bunch of coffee, and um, that was uh, and and got a per diem. And then um, a couple weeks later, the uh, came up here to Pittsburgh, and it was complete opposite experience, <laughs> like. First of all, NREC is amazing to walk into. Like it's great. Yeah, it's, it's a cool great show. Facility, it's a cool sure. facility, like beautiful facility. And the um, um, I couldn't tell anybody's rank because everybody was wearing like flannels and t-shirts and blue jeans. I didn't know who was important, who wasn't important. I'm dressed in a freaking uniform, right? Like you know, you look at my shoulders and see how important I am, and I know where I stack up compared to everybody else. Very, very different vibe. Super informal compared to the formality of Lockheed Martin. Yeah, some of the people you find out what they accomplish that are in that program. Like, I mean, just being a grad student at CMU back in the day. And, I mean, like I told you, I found out John Dolan was a colonel. I was like, holy, you never, yeah. you'd never know. You'd never know. I knew him for over a year before I found out. Yeah. And so, yeah, no, that's, that's spot on. No, it's, um, it, was, it was awesome. Like, we did the reviews. Um, I was providing input. Um, I... I drove their prototype within two hours of showing up. Well, maybe more than two hours because I'm, we were all kind of early arrivers. And the, you know, then the tech team showed up a little bit later, so it's fine. Yeah, you know? of course. <laughs> but the, uh, um, but uh, um, yeah, they let me crash into some cars, like first time there. And, nice. And stuff like that. It was great. And I gave them some input. And so they kept asking me to come back, which was the opposite experience that I had with Lockheed Martin. And awesome. the uh, and so I did, you know, and I was getting ready to get out of the service, and the, uh, um, you know, at one point they were just like, hey, you know, uh, um, you know, Sergeant Byer, the next time you come back here, like uh, these are the things that we want to work on, and I was like, oh no, I can't help you out, man, I'm terminal, and they're like, you're dying, and I was like, no, I'm getting out of the service, <laughs> and they were like, well, what are you gonna do, and I was like, well, you know, I I got back into grad school, I'm just gonna, you know, like, um, um, you know go go back to school and they were like in what and i was like uh um you know geography and hydrology they're like you're gonna measure r rain runoff and i was like yeah i like to be outside i don't mind being wet <laughs> like i've established that um and they're like oh no no come here like uh you need you need to be a staff engineer here at nrec but that's you got staff engineer right into it yep that's awesome yep so the uh so 
Um, of course, like CMU you had to like create the position and things like that. And so in the interim, um, I got out of the service. And then at the time, um, RE squared was mostly, um, it was probably like Jorgen and like 10 dudes at that point. It wasn't even 10. No, it was, it was, it was Jorgen. It was, uh, uh, Keith Gunnett, um, the, uh, um, uh, Jesse and Mark DeLewis, um, and, uh, John Culbertson. And it was a lot of how CMU would pay 1099s, like, through Jurgen. Interesting. So Jurgen would just turn it into W two and pay that person. Yeah. So so I was at ten ninety nine for RE squared. Um, the uh, you know. Oh, he was just going straight ten ninety nine pass through. Yeah. Okay. And then he did he didn't convert people to uh, W two until until I was there, and then um, uh, and a couple of months had passed, and then you know he brought a bunch of us on as as W two. Um, and then um, I love you, Jurgen. Congratulations! He's to a great dude. He's, he's, he's class he sitting right where you're sitting now. No, it's, a little bit it's totally, yeah, totally like fantastic. Um, and yeah, it's CEO of Sarcos. Now. That's right. Yeah. But when when CMU was like, "Hey, we made the position," um, I took a pay cut to go be a staff engineer at, at CMU, and um, and and left uh, left Ari Squared. But the uh, uh, Ari Squared was awesome. Like treated me treated me super well. And yeah, they're, they're good people. Memories. Yeah done some work with them as well and I, I've, I've always they're sophisticated in that like they will beat you up on every single detail of an engineering project but I, I like that about them because I feel like I'd always rather work with somebody that understands the work and appreciates it and knows the difficulties well that's right and, and, and you only get client. better through criticism yep so it's uh, yeah it's um, no they're that's a that's a that's a great group so um, yeah, get to say that I was employee number or whatever six, like at at, at RE squared two. But then, but then awesome. I ran back and went to uh, uh, went to went to CMU. So straight out of the Marines, you went to RE squared, then you went to NRAC. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And uh, I mean, I never moved my desk. My desk was always in the same spot in NRAC, like with uh, Frank Campania <laughs> and Mike Risk, and um, and uh, you know John Culbertson, um, who stayed at RE squared, stayed on contract. Um, but the uh, but that was uh, that was a great crew. Like working on the Gladiator project, that was fantastic, and um, the uh, learned a lot there. And then also got to work on like um, you know a little bit of this and a little bit of that, uh, as well as uh, Crusher, um, yeah, the oh, UPI that's program. Legendary. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I was the payload designer for uh, for Crusher for oh, the cool. the weapon systems and the mast and all the stuff. Yeah, we don't show too many stuff about. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I got to be the main uh, tally operation pilot in the Vomit Comet. Wait, yeah. you had to be in the Vomit Comet to drive Crusher? Oh, this was a whole thing. So there's a, there's a great paper. Um, I think Bill Ross is... Bill Ross should have been the lead author on it if he was. When wasn't. you say the Vomit Comet, you're referring to a plane that... No, gravity, no, 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 no. The no, thing no. that spins around really fast in NASA? Well, no, really named fun. after as such. So the Vomit okay. Comet was a six degree of freedom teleoperation cockpit. What the f Why that do you was, need that? Okay. That was designed for Crusher. Interesting, all right. So Crusher had so this- It's named after the thing at NASA, but it's a different thing. That's right, Okay. Got because it. it made people throw up. We didn't name it the Vomit Comet until after- Some people vomit. Five other people threw up, like in, <laughs> in the Vomit Comet. Like the, uh, so, no, it's brilliant. So, um, uh, so Bill Ross and John Chu, on um, John Bears's like UPI, John Bears and Tony Stens were the co uh, co principal investigators on UPI. One of the things that we investigated was teleoperation. The reason we why we wanted to investigate that was because at the time this was back during the uh, Donald Rumsfeld future combat systems malarkey. Interesting. Where I didn't follow this that closely, admittedly. It's the. I mean, it's fair. This is this is like. 15 years ago or something, right? Like, right, and this so like was- 2007-ish. Yeah, so like 2007-ish. And, and, uh, and so future combat systems, primes, and, and contractors were purporting that they were well- do subtraction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so they, were, they were doing, um, there were some requirements on these systems called like the armed robotic vehicle, um, and uh, just a bit. Uh, so the armed robotic vehicle, um, let's focus on that one. The, the Army, backed by Boeing as the prime and SAIC as the lead system integrator, they had created some totally un, 
realistic requirements about the amount of bandwidth that would need to be available to drive and basically remote control tank or fighting vehicle like at long range. Were they high or low? They were so low, <laughs> it was laughable. And so we read these when um, uh, I went out to Fort Knox to the unit of what they call the unit of action um, maneuver battle lab, which were, which were a bunch of people that were paper fighting and war gaming yeah. future combat systems. And like I got exposed to a bunch of the requirements there and, and everything else. And it wasn't just me. There were se several of us from, uh, from CMU and the, uh, um, and some of the requirements were just like bananas, right? Like, like the idea that you could compress, send and uncompress video at like, let's say, what would have been one of their targets? Um, kilobits per second and have enough resolution to operate a tank. And we're like, how much, how much autonomy are you giving the vehicle? Because there's the, the you famous- You need a buttload to make that work. Right, like, um, um, and a measured buttload because yeah. Tony Stenz, who was one of the PIs on UPI, has, uh, and you can find this, this paper, he has these beautiful charts about um, like bandwidth and autonomy, like trade-off, right? And yeah. just plots it. That's and, interesting. And it's like based on Tony time, this? time now. Tony Stenz did this back in, Tony, 2006, like uh, 2007. You, you need that for interplanetary work. So that's why that's so interesting. No, it's true. the delay that's built into that. And there's been a lot of that in there. And so, yeah. so, the, uh, so this, this uh, uh, UPI funded by DARPA, right? Um, and Larry Hennebeck was the, uh, was the PI on that. And um, uh, on the DARPA side of the house, he funded this teleoperation study. Um, and even uh, Scott Fish, who was SAIC's lead scientist, um, and he was faculty at University of Texas, uh, Austin, um, and created their kind of NREC competitor afterwards. Oh, cool. Um, Didn't know they had that. They're all, this is all kind of munched together, right? Like, yeah. uh, the, um, like to me, this is all like celebrity of, of uh, early 2000s, like robotics or whatever. Um, they funded this teleop study. And so uh, Bill Ross, who lives in, you know, the Adirondacks in upstate, upstate New York, like uh, in his villain's lair. Um, the, uh, um, There's a bunch of those up there? That's right. Tons of them. Like more, more than we know, I think, um, especially the fly-in camps. I would hope so. Um, and uh, I aspire to that. And the, <laughs> you still want uh, to buy a Titan missile site? Like, just uh, a bit? You know, it's a little creepy for me, but um, he had uh, um, uh, a, a brilliant developer at the time, um, John Chu, um, who is... The, uh, uh, he's at a defense AI startup right now. Uh, so Bill Ross and John Chu wrote this full, crazy, badass, teleop, like, AV server. And so what it did was we used an iRobot designed fiber tether um, to UPI. What's UPI? Um, the, uh, the crusher. Okay, got it. Yeah, sorry. Um, and we had this top hat design. The top hat design was five... Um, HD cameras. You have physical fiber tether going. Yep, to physical okay. fiber. Fi yeah, uh, two kilometer long, but I think wow. we stuck it with like one kilometer, like yeah. operating limit because you get it tangled around crap and so like yeah. just drive. And you had that on a spool, I'm guessing. Yep, on okay. a spool, um, cool. um, doing an auto payout, and then the uh, so that came all the way back. It went into the AV server, so that and it, you know it's a little bit of a trick to make sure that you're doing the capture and the uh, uh, decoding and then display. Without adding any late, any real late, late, you know, basic latency, latency. Yeah. Um, and then, and then they created all these dials and software where they could reduce the resolution, change the oh, cool. field of view, That's awesome. add latency. Um, oh, do you want to add latency? Because uh, that's the reality of like these. Oh, to emulate wireless. That's right. Okay. So you that. would, uh, um, and so you could. You could add latency on the way back, and then you could add a different control lag. And so you could have them on an asymmetric loop. That's pretty cool. Which is realistic. Correct. Right? Yeah. And, and, then, um, and then that got played into the Vomit Comet. So if you go into the Vomit Comet, and the paper's great. There's even a YouTube video of it. Um, and there's still a Vimeo on uh, the NREC website. When you open the door to the Vomit Comet, and this is a little like 
like four foot by four foot box on top of a six dock motion platform. Wow. There was like a like Logitech. Six, so you had roll pitch yawn and X, Y, Z. Yep. Okay, that's cool. right. And the, um, and then you have, um, there was a Logitech steering wheel and like a video game one. Yep. And a gas nice. pedal and brake. That's awesome. Then you had a map display Grand and then Theft five Auto. screens. Oh, nice. Exactly. And the, uh, and, and the experiment was driving to an unknown point and do it and exploring. Right. And then, cool. you know, optimizing, optimizing the route. And the operator had no idea what the hell was going to be there. So it was realistic in that way too. That's right. That's really cool. Um, so the, uh, so I was the first, first operator. Wow. Um, so no, it was great. Uh, it was it's legendary. It's... So excited. Oh, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was the best. This is the best field up I've ever been on in my entire life. Like so, cool. so I, I not not the least of which is it was out, it was out in Somerset, Pennsylvania, and uh, and for lunch every day we had takeout from the Summit Diner. Which uh, shout out to the Summit Diner in Somerset, like uh, amazing, cool. everything from scratch. That's anyway, cool. Scotch the, is great. This is the best, and because uh, we keep talking about food, so ah, um, the uh, yeah, so I, so I got to drive. Um, I drove a mission, and then it was all good, and hopped out, and uh, oh. There was also a uh, one-gallon jug on a uh, um, on Velcro, within reach of the, uh, the six-point harness. No, for you to vomit into. That's hilarious. And uh, and then a two-way to control, and so, so I, I drove my I drove my route. I hopped out. Felt great. Like uh, blah blah blah. Went on. Kept doing my other experiments with the payload system, and um, and then the next next driver got in there and um, lost it. Lunch comes up immediately. Immediately, and then the next shout guy. Out to Summit Diner. And then uh, yeah, and uh, you shout out to Summit Diner. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> and then the next one, and then the next one, and then um, and then there's this awkward time when uh, um, Dave Stager was uh, kind of shepherding the, the field out, and he comes over to me and he was just like, Brian, we, um, you know, he's always very serious. He's like, Brian. Um, um, we're gonna need you to get in there and uh, and run another mission, and uh, I was like, yeah, no, it sounds awesome. Like I'd love to. Like the, the best thing ever. Yeah, I'll, I'll hop in and do it. So I hop in and I do another mission, and then hop out, and then everybody's standing around, and they're like, how do you feel? And I was like, uh, I'm great. And they were like, um, could you maybe do another mission? I'm like, yeah, like right now. Yeah, I'll hop back in. So I hop back in and I run another mission. Then I get out, and what I what I realized was um, they uh, they ran out of other operators. <laughs> and so then they were like, could you stay on the field lot for a little bit? I'm like, what would I be doing? And they were like, just driving. And I was like, yes, yes, please. <laughs> and um, it was the best field lot. That's awesome. And um, yeah, the only time that I, got, that, that I got seasick was I recommended that, um, I remember when I was at the Unit of Action Battle Lab, Maneuver Battle Lab out in Fort Knox, they thought that these teleoperators for these armored fighting, these robotic fighting vehicles um, would be in an armored personnel carrier sitting 45 degrees off of center in the station and driving them while they were on the move. Interesting. So, so I said, why 45 degrees off? So you could fit them. Okay, okay. makes sense. So you have two. So you could, you could fit, yeah, you could fit, I think you could fit six the way like that, weird. So, okay. like herringbone. Yeah, like, yeah. Okay, got it. But if you went sideways, you could only fit one row, and so you'd only there's use the driver. There's the door. There's a driver. So, okay. Yeah. So the and yeah. a driver TC, and then the and then the crew Tank compartment. Driver. Yeah. Okay. And so I suggested like, hey, why don't we why don't we see if I can drive this while I am 45 degrees off axis, and you play back a different motion platform, like a motion profile than what you're capturing off of the robot, because these guys aren't going to be on six offs, right? And they're like, really? And then Larry Hennebeck got nervous. Like, Dr. Hennebeck was like, I don't know that we filled out the human experiment paperwork so that we could do this test. I was like, no, no, it's totally fine. Like, let's just- I'll sign whatever waiver we must. Yeah, let's, let's, just, let's just take, take the last run and just like- Play that back. Play, play that back with a 45 degree bias so I'm 45 they degrees off for of motion. Like, yeah, the John Chu did it on cool. the spot, right? Wow. And then, um, and, and then they played that back. So I'm in the thing and moving around and bouncing and jiving. Totally they built in the transforms. I mean, that's incredible. Like, oh, it was it, this. This was a brilliantly well thought out experiment. Yeah. Like, and it was massively underutilized. Like, the thing should have been three months long. 
Nice. And it should have had a hundred operators and and I and and if the you know if the military had listened to all the lessons, I think I think different things would have occurred with uh, with requirements. But makes sense. sense. In any case, um, it was super fun and awesome. Best two weeks I've spent in the field with the robots ever. That's awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I got a little bit seasick, but uh, but didn't puke. Not even at forty five degrees with a different motion robot. Huh? No, I was I was able to just like um, I think like. You know, at the end of the day, um, I was, um, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, but I, I think I think I'm actually like an early millennial and was just like ready to have a screen in the in the back seat of a car from birth, and and the technology just wasn't there yet. Yeah. So, and the fact is, these days, now nah, you'd be able to find, you know, like a super high percentage of the unit would be able to do this operation. That's cool. Like because kids just like play on their screens, like all in the back long. of a moving car all day long. Well, so why did you need the six stop motion platform? for the initial experiment. I get it for the second experiment. So the whole idea was was to try to understand, it was a min-max problem. So they were like, what if we gave the user everything? No latency, like the best resolution cameras, um, a full, sensa yeah, yeah. full sensation of being in the cockpit. Like, do they, like, do they, by metrics, do they outperform oh, interesting. not having so motions? So what's necessary out of all that shit is what they're trying right. to Right, so what's optimum performance versus what's necessary. So they yeah. were trying to min-max it. Yeah, it makes sense. It was a lot of fun, it was, it was a, it, and it's a fun paper. In terms of the finding, I mean, I, obviously I could read the thing, but just because I got you right here, like, do you need the gantry or can you, you don't. get, okay, that makes sense. You don't. You need some way to capture, um, the roll pitch in a way that's sensible to the operator. So I think you could magic eight ball it like you do. When you say magic eight ball. Oh, like a um, so in aircraft the uh, um, gimbal display of uh, attitude, right? Yeah. Um, so a lot of pilots, a lot of as, um, as as a ground pounder would call them zipper so suited. As long as you give that attitude display, mm -hmm. and you don't have to actually have the person experience it to understand it and be able to. Correct. As okay. long as they know to pay attention to it and they know yeah. what it means when you go above a certain point. So, so if the robot's like flipping over backwards, you should know about it before it happens. Exactly. exactly what it comes down to. Yep. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah, precisely. Um, and so... Did you get to mess with the version that was able to self-write? Or is that... that oh, get... yeah. So so the self-writing one, so that was Spinner. So that was the prior generation. Yeah. So um, the irony of Spinner was that its center of gravity was so low, we were unable in testing... Um, out in Yuma, Arizona, <laughs> to roll it under natural conditions. Wow. So we were driving it at full bore, you know, I don't know, like 40 kilometers per hour on a heavy side slope, trying to turn uphill. So it's like around like 17 miles an hour or so. Yeah. Okay. And um, and then we just kept pushing the speed up and, and pushing the um, um, the uh, angle, angle of incline, angle of turn up, and we couldn't flip it over. So finally, we had to take, what we did was we took the, uh, we had a telehandler out there for vehicle recovery. Um, and we flipped it over with the telehandler. <laughs> and then we proved that at least the payload bay could rotate. And that's why Crusher doesn't self-write. It's because it's not necessary. No, we fun. made, uh, Crusher was an even lower center of gravity. Nice. So the, uh, um, yeah, you don't need to self-write. That was, that was bogus. But I mean, the crux of the- It kind of makes sense though why engineers would think that at the onset of the project. Well, the whole idea of the, of the project that produced Spinner, that was the unmanned ground combat vehicle program by DARPA, was if you didn't have a human pilot in the vehicle, what could you make that vehicle do? What could that vehicle do without worrying about a human being and their life support and their well-being? And I'll tell you this, you could, you could make a thing so terrainable that you can't chase it in a Humvee without causing like injury or discomfort to the operator. That's awesome. Like that's easy. Of the Humvee. Of the Humvee, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, we we had to actually change our chase vehicle strategy on uh, Crusher, which was way more capable. So you had to be Spinner probably was. like a bit further back, I would guess, well, just to low pass filter that shot. You, you would just basically hand off safety control to yeah. a bunch of static operators. You couldn't chase it. Static control on the chase vehicle or on Crusher? No, so what you would what you would do is so for the most part on on Crusher it was running either on autonomy or playback. Uh, so a lot of times on a on a rough terrain loop, what we would do is we would we would teach it a path and then we'd run it on playback cool. for twenty four hours, right? Wow, just and, and just watch it keep just to break go it. and yeah. go and try to break it. Yep, that's because uh, that's how we do it. 
And yeah, that's, uh, that's the crux of CMU. I do it as well. That's right. <laughs> and so um, we set up a bunch of, um, back then, little uh, Axis video encoders and uh, as independent Wi-Fi nodes. So nice. we had fixed cameras set up around this uh, old strip mine. I might have ended up with those as a grad school trash. You board. never know. Yeah, <laughs> that stuff floats around. I have like seven axis encoders in a box somewhere that I found in the dumpster. Around there. Man, they're still good. Like uh, that, <laughs> that's great. That's great hardware. You know, great hardware is timeless. And um, so, like, I mean, you could dust cr Crusher off today, and it's still going to outperform like ninety nine percent of uh, off road vehicles, right? Yeah. Um, but the uh, yeah, you just couldn't chase the thing. You just couldn't chase it. You either had to sit in a place where you could watch the whole thing. You had to instrument the test site. Yeah, yeah, it was awesome. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, cool. so much fun. That's a great program. You ever hear about the paint uh, on the Crusher? Paint. Not yet. I'll be right back. I'm just gonna hit. This anecdote takes like 30 seconds. So we. Uh, uh, I've been enjoying this conversation. <laughs> so, um, I mean, yeah. For any of you listening to the podcast, if you haven't looked at uh, Carnegie Mellon University's uh, Crusher robot videos, like it's. It's a seriously we, intense. We could try to splice in a, in like a video clip oh. of that if you got a good one. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, could, I could send you some links. Like, That'd be awesome. so it's, you know, it's this. I don't know, twenty thousand pound capable, like, like you know, significantly bigger than a Humvee, massively capable, um, series electric hybrid, um, like six six by six. Um, you know, all independently. Each controlled. wheel is a single motor, each, right? Each wheel is a motor. Them. Yep. Like each one has an independently um, controlled actuation on the suspension. Wow. So independent ride height Active capability. Suspension. So you could lean it left and right, stand it up, like uh, pull so cool. pull two wheels up, like um, and uh, um, it was a space frame construction. Space frame. Uh, space frame. So rather than a monocoque, r rather than like um, um, you know a. Uh, um, like a unibody that combines the chassis and the and the um, and the shell, which is like a monocoque hull. Like this was a space frame hull, so it's uh, um, you know just uh, rigid members all the way around the outside, but none of the um, exterior panels that enclose the the system are structurally required. Oh, cool! Right, so you could like strip it all down, That's and awesome. it could be like super bare bones. Yeah, I think it could be. It, it, it could be super, super lightweight when it was stripped or down. Or you could probably add armor panel on for it, That was the whole point, yeah. right? Like, so the, uh, um, actually the belly pan was really, really cool. So the belly pan was, um, um, God, what kind of steel was that? Was that, so it was the same steel that's used in the, um, the bed of ore trucks. Oh, I don't know what that is. And rock uh, trucks, right? Like, yeah. so it's like a, it's like um, Aircraft a, 100, 4130. Um, probably not a stainless. So I'm not going to go. No, 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 no. It would be S7. closer to like a 4130. No, it was, okay. it was uh, but, um, you know, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah nice, well played. And, um, but it wasn't attached with fasteners. We learned that trick on, on spinner. So it was actually held on by straps. Interesting. Because Why? the belly pan gets the crap kicked out of it. And so if you have fasteners on, you're going to cut the fastener heads off or you're going to maul them Drop to a them. point where you can't, like, uh, or, you know, yeah, you remove them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we, uh, um, we basically shackled or clamped on the belly pan and it worked great. Maybe it was hard ox. I think it was hard ox. Hard ox, cool. Um, and um, anyway, that was, that was neat and novel. Um, little Volkswagen TDI engine. Um, custom nice. lithium ion battery pack made by Saft, which we had our first major lithium Somebody ion battery pack fire. Somebody told me there was fire. like similar horsepower to like a, what is it, like a Ford F-150 in each of the wheels, but if you had a Volkswagen TDI engine, that would have been able to generate that type of... It doesn't have to. It's a okay. serious electric hybrid. So all the, all the Volkswagen TDI engine had to do was charge up the battery pack. Okay. The battery, as long as your conductors are large enough, provides instantaneous power to each wheel motor. Okay, so you don't run it at that type of horsepower level. You time. never run it at the Volkswagen horsepower level. That's just a generator yeah. to recharge the battery. Got it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And That's we cool. can recharge it faster with an off, off board, right? That's awesome. Like, so, uh, yeah, very, very cool. Eric Mayhofer um, was the uh, lead mechanical. Nice. On that project, I've heard good things about that guy. I haven't met him. Uh, oh, he's he's uh, he's brilliant. He's fantastic. Um, he was uh, he was the director of Uber's autonomous, um, you know, a, the uh, ATG group, like cool. uh, um, here in Pittsburgh for a while after John Bears was. 
um, until until they got acquired by Aurora, and he yeah. didn't move over to Aurora. Makes sense. Um, yeah, no, Eric is uh, uh, brilliant. Got aqua hired. Yeah, yeah, he did not get aqua hired like uh, dur during that. Everybody else did. Um, no, he's fantastic. Like I remember, um, seventeen years ago, um, him and another. Um, you know, CMU royalty genius, uh, Mark Sivanak, uh, um, one of the best electrical engineers. Um, they had this company called um, Third Computer, and they were making both uh, medical tools for um, like some UPMC surgeon and also like high end custom paintball toting, like teleoperated robots. Oh, that's <laughs> like, interesting. For the same group. Yeah. So was, Wait, for the same group? Who yeah. the fuck was their client? Yeah, yeah, uh, a doctor had too much money. <laughs> yeah, a, a perfect client. Yeah, amazing client. Yeah, um, I've had clients like that. Um, there's there's a certain surgeon. I mean, it's going to be obvious. It, Ken Yur, she's been on the podcast. He's great. But uh, he qualifies medical robots. Very interesting dude. Um, uh, orthopedics. Is, yeah. This is his game. And uh, that guy is hilarious. Like, I, I bought recently kind of a stupid purchase. I had a... Um, Burgundy Paisley smoking jacket slash evening jacket made for way too much money. <laughs> and I sent a picture to Dr. Yurish. She's like, oh, we should go to the Duquesne Club. <laughs> he texted me back immediately. <laughs> nice. <laughs> My wife saw it, Tom. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. I owe you a cigar and a cognac. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, he's a good dude. I like him a lot. Yeah, so the, the paint problem um, was the uh, we had contracted with... Um, uh, Concurrent Technologies Corporation, a uh, not-for-profit out of Johnstown, um, the uh, excellent metallurgists, to design the space frame itself. And so, like, we've got, and Eric Myhofer, like, for us at CMU, had this brilliant breakdown of all the masses of everything that went into the whole damn thing. Wow. And it should have been perfect. And so we finally built it. And it's there, you know, like uh, 10th an Street. That's an expensive paintball robot. If I'm thinking of the right project, I apologize. Oh, no, no, no. This is uh, changing gears back. This is Crusher again. I am so sorry. The uh, paint project with the Crusher. So, okay. so we assembled this doggone thing. Okay. And then we have, uh, we have our crane overhead. And it's got a scale in the crane. Yeah. And we pick it up. And it weighs 400 pounds more than Eric predicted it was going to weigh. I'm guessing cabling? No. Well be it's... No, we went through all of this. Okay, well, I mean, based on the heading of the project side of the paint. We just didn't account for the paint properly. We just didn't put enough weight in for, we put, we put in paint as if it was wet paint and um, we used um, a powder coat on the full space frame. And it was, apparently it was a pretty thick layer of powder coat. So we had 40 pound, four, 400 pounds more of powder coat than we expected to have. Wow. Yep. That's a lot of powder coat. It's a lot of powder coat. Well, I mean... You probably wanted it, though. I mean, A lot I, of surfaces. You yeah. Know? And, and if you hadn't had it, I mean, that would have blight pretty quickly and then you'd run into corrosion issues. That's exactly so. right. No, I mean, the, the, the thing was fantastic. Like, it was a great program, a lot of fun. Um, learned a lot. And the uh, it turned into, um, you know, it, it had a follow-on that was run by the Army, not by DARPA, APD, um, which, uh, you know, it was... It was much more high speed instead of high mobility, so it was doing like cornering at like 50 miles an hour, wow. 90 degrees cornering with a skid steer. That's so cool. And not flipping over. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, Crusher was skid steer too, though. It was. Wasn't yeah. It? Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pratt and Miller, who uh, used to design race cars and stuff out in Detroit, uh, Pratt and Miller Engineering uh, did our torque vector and control for uh, APD. Um, uh, the uh, what do they call it? The advanced platform demonstrator. Got so this it. is the follow on the crusher, and uh, which could corner at fifty miles an hour, ninety degrees, like amazing. <laughs> and um, wait, yeah. like straight up ninety degrees at fifty miles an hour, like you're going fifty. Yeah, I mean it would drift a little bit, right? Okay. But like, uh, but yeah, wow. Like you just put it into a hard, hard turn, and uh, it could That's do insane. it. Really low center of gravity, good torque factoring control. Okay, so you're talking about like testing the limits of what humans can do like a, a person would vomit i mean you wouldn't oh, they're not staying yeah i mean that's that's yeah, the whole thing I mean, when, when you think about like um in aircraft if you think about unmanned wingmen yeah. they should vastly outperform like the capabilities of the f-35 because like the f-35 for example or the f-22 they're limited by the squishy meat sock 
that's yeah. fly in this stupid and under thing. the G's you're going to pass out or die. That's right. Whereas, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So the uh, no, the future skies will be owned by owned by robots. Probably. Yeah, but the uh, no, those were those were really fun programs. Those were great yeah, programs. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, the uh, the people that designed the torque vectoring um, at Pratt and Miller Racing, um, they ended up that that was kind of their entry into doing um, uh, defense robotics, and so they they now have they just got bought by Oshkosh. I think. Oh, interesting. It's a good acquisition, I feel like. Yeah, no, it was very good. From an IP perspective. Oh, totally. I mean, they've got a good robot group. Oshkosh has a good robot group. Like, uh, Pratt & Miller is, like, the leaders in, uh, um, in like, mobility, mobility design. Like, good bunch of guys. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, who else are you watching these days for, like, that kind of technology? I'd be interested to hear, kind of... Oh, um, yeah, my imagination running wild in a way that it hasn't done since I was a kid. So this is yeah. So there, I mean, there's a bunch of you, when you're on the military side of the house. There's a there's yeah, a bunch of this is a world I know very little about. So I'm excited. You know, there, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interesting interesting stuff going on. So the um, um, there's a lot going on optional manned vehicle design. So, optional man. So you could man it, but you could also have it run on. That's man. right. Yeah. yeah. So the uh, there, there's a lot going on there. Um, uh, NAMC, which is a consortium, and I think they're National Automotive Manufacturing Consortium. Okay. I apologize if I got that 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 wrong. Um, the uh, uh, sorry, Alyssa. The um, so they're out in Detroit. Actually, they grew out of the bones of a of a. Um, a Pittsburgh group called the Robotic Tech Collaborative. I don't know if you remember those guys back in like 2011, 2012. It was a little before my time. Like I, I was, I would have still been an undergrad. At oh, that no worries. Yeah. So they faded out and then they, they turned into, um, uh, Namsi. Um, and, um, uh, Bill Thomas Meyer like started the Robotic Tech Collaborative here and then went out to Detroit and started up the NAMC and kind of pulled a bunch of uh, a bunch of the stuff in there. Cool. Um, they have a whole lot of interesting um, uh, team members um, and things that they're doing. So like Textron teamed up with the, uh, the small business, and I just can't remember the name of them for the life of me, but they made the Ripsaw um, oh, cool. uh, tracked vehicle. Like have you ever seen that? Was that was the How and How. Yeah, they, yeah, 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 exa- yeah, so good, so good. And so, like, I think they. So that was a third-party contractor that made that. Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, the uh, well, I think they I'm were. A big kind fan, of, so I love track platforms. No, I think you they can probably tell from looking at. Oh yeah, so they stuff got in my offices. They <laughs> were on contract to DARPA, and then for one of the, um, like one of the new ground vehicle um, contracts that got let by, through the NAMC consortium, um, through their OTA, their other transactional agreement, um, that. That went to Textron, and I think, I think How and How is a uh, some contract with them on that, okay. and, and brought up brought over a bunch of their design. That's cool. So that's fun. They're they're good to follow. Um, you know, Pratt Miller obviously like they have uh, uh, they have a pretty cool project for the, for the Marine Corps that they did, um, which was a successful SBIR called the EMAV. Um, and um, uh, let's see if we if we're gonna play figure out what the acronym means. That'd be X- <laughs> Expeditionary uh, Marine, I don't know, assault vehicle, amphibious vehicle, something along those lines, autonomous vehicle, whatever. It's basically um, a skateboard, um, you know, like what? Multiple wheeled right. with uh, with a nice flat deck on the top. So if you strip down a Tesla, and you get down to you know like so a big skateboard. Bare, it's like a big skateboard, okay. but skid steer tracked, Interesting. like instead of Ackerman steered, um, and then you could throw payloads on the top. Cool. So the EMAB's pretty novel. Um, For a second, uh, I was picturing Marines on skateboards. And oh no, not like that. Yeah. Um, yeah so so this one, uh, Brian Barr is the the lead on on that. Great name, good good initials. Um, he yeah for sure. Um, so so a competitor has a smaller, less capable but similar vehicle, more capable in its own right, but you know like not as fast um, and large and aggressive like a smaller. Um, you know, m- maybe a little bit more off-road capable, but I'd have to see them side by side. It makes sense. Um, by uh, Stratum, which is a, um, a veteran-owned um, small business out of uh, out of Boulder. They've been around forever. They had this oh, really great area too, Boulder. I love. Oh, beautiful. Um, yeah. The uh, 
That's, um, did you know that the uh, University of Colorado at Boulder is famous for their Halloween riot every Actually? year? Yes. So police departments around the U.S. <laughs> would send people before Halloween to learn, like, uh, crowd control. From like Boulder. Uh, in Boulder, when uh, UC Boulder would have their, um, the, uh, it always starts with when somebody lights a perfectly good couch on fire, right? <laughs> That's anyway, sorry, tangent. No, no, no. My, my Total. one cousin went there, and she's now at NIST as like a research scientist. Oh, cool. Big fan of that area. Her wedding was there. It was one of the most picturesque, beautiful weddings I've ever been to. Oh, Love yeah. It. Want to go to the Red Rocks Amphitheater really bad. There's there's a concert I want to see there. I might buy a ticket. I, don't know. I saw the Killers there. That's and, cool. Um, Jealous. Yeah, 20... What would that have been? 2009, maybe? That's all. I've been on a bluegrass kick lately, so like Billy Strings is doing a lot. Oh, that'd, that'd be cool. Yeah. yeah, that'd be cool. It's an, it's an amazing amphitheater. Like, yeah. absolutely yeah. amazing. The two ships, it's great. Like, um, the... Uh, yeah, um, Boulder actually has uh, another good venue. They have this uh, old theater, like, downtown. And um, I saw Chris Christopherson there, and a lot of people uh, don't know that. Jealous. Chris Christopherson was a, uh, is a highly decorated um, Army helicopter Wait, pilot. Seriously? Yeah, you don't know this? I didn't know this. Nobody fucking knows this, right? And this, yeah. this, so so we're, so I'm like the, you know, my wife and I are like the youngest youngest kids at this Chris Christopherson concert, which has all these old hippies from Boulder that like showed up in force to, to you know, like, um, you know, watch him play like his, his best of from like the civil, S- Silver Tongue Devil and I and whatever else. And I'm getting a beer and walking back in and, um, you know, some... Uh, um, some old groupie was just like, uh, you know, like, aren't you a little young to be at a Chris Christopherson concert? And I was just like, uh, I'm just here to support another veteran. And like, she was like, Chris Christopherson's not a veteran. It's like, okay, first of all, read his history. Like, the dude is a highly decorated Vietnam War helicopter pilot. Like, did the whole thing. I yeah. mean, how else does he know how to like land a helicopter in Johnny Cash's yard, right? <laughs> like he didn't just go and like learn how to fly a helicopter. Like the freaking dude is, uh, you know, a West Pointer. Like the guys, the guys like uh, secretly this like amazing vet and um, low key, super low key. Yeah, like just doesn't wear it out openly. Like guys, guys, incredible, great songwriter. That's awesome. Yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. Um, Similar to John Dolan in that way. Yeah, exactly. Right, <laughs> understated. You know, yeah, for sure. The uh, like the opposite of guys like like me and Red Whitaker. You know, yeah, like, I feel like I'm a little bit of a cunt as well. Like I'm a little bit louder than I should be sometimes. Yeah, it's you know it is what it is. <laughs> so it's um it's fun. It's part of the East Coast vibe. Yeah, so, for sure. I, like yeah. I mean, it's, as I got my ring with snakes with fucking diamonds for eyes on. Yeah, it. there you go. Like, <laughs> yeah, all good. So. Um, yeah, no, Boulder, Boulder was, uh, uh, Boulder's great. So Stratum, they're somebody to watch. They've been growing a lot recently. Their, their first thing that they did for the DOD that I knew about, um, and they're, uh, uh, they're run by, by a former Marine. Um, the, uh, the first thing that they had that was, that was a good success was a robotic pallet. A robotic pallet. Okay, cool. Yep. So instead of just having a pallet, it was just a robot. Yeah, because the, all the shit regards, revolves around pallet handling, rather. And so, so they just made the fucking so you pallet. you move. Yeah, yeah, you're good. No, it's brilliant. And so they, they specifically targeted um, air transport in the military. So it is a standard skid okay. for the cargo Air planes. Force and yeah. cargo planes and the Marine Corps and the Navy and everything else. And uh, That's they, awesome. they, they've sold a ton of them. Yeah, it's yeah, great. Yeah, great. Yeah. But it makes sense for like high value cargo. Like, why dick around with a forklift when you can just scurry that? If you're not going to kick it out of the back on a parachute, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, if you're going to reuse it, if you're going to go like base to base, yeah, absolutely. Why not? I had a client with a really interesting idea, and I feel like I can talk about this a little bit because they've since withdrawn from the market, as it were. And so, um, it it was. self-driving pylons for construction sites so mm. like um you know like a traffic uh pattern oh my god highway. the mischief maker in me just wants to hack into that and just <laughs> cause all kinds of mayhem like that uh, dude, but still you're like the that's... kind of person like i was driving around oakland but i was in uh undergrad and i remember some asshole had moved one to the center of the street 
and I look down at the wrong moment to check the speedo, and I crash and then you lock it. Oh, yeah, exactly. no. yeah, no, that's terrible. What? what it was jerks. hilarious. Yeah, people are terrible. Well, I mean, I had a used Honda. It didn't really matter. It was just kind of made me crap my pants and then yeah. went with my dad. Hondas are amazing. What brilliant appliances. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, so good. Um, who else? Who else to keep track of? Um, uh, of course, uh, Anduril. Uh-huh. Like. Um, yeah, so the, uh, um, what is that? That's the name of Arag- Aragorn's, uh, Aragorn's sword in um, the uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy, like uh, uh, the sword of the Flame of the West, uh-huh. like Andoril. Um So this is, uh, um, this is a Peter Thiel-backed oh, uh, like guy is startup. And, um, so he is interesting. And so this is... Um, God, this I can't remember the. You know the whole Kogan lawsuit, like his role in that, right? I do not. So okay, I don't mean to derail, but no, I'm please. This is interesting. So like, Hulk Hogan got caught um, making a sex tape with Bubba Love Sponge's wife, like consensually. They were cool with, you know, they were swingers, but like, what had happened was um, he says the N word. Like, it's it's not a good look for Hulk Hogan. That's a terrible look for Hulk Hogan. It, it ruins his career, career, right? And so like. Um, anyway, um, fast forward, you know, he doesn't have a job anymore. Peter Thiel had been out of his gay by uh, Gawker magazine a little bit ago and was very upset about this. And so he basically puts a bounty on Gawker privately and is like, if anybody is sufficient to bring Gawker down, I will back their lawsuit and, and cover it. You know? oh. So I, I think it was like a $10 million like, legal team that he, I, I might have the number wrong, I'm sorry if I do. But he, he pays for this expensive legal dream team for Hulk Hogan. And Hulk Hogan ends up owning Gawker at the end of the lawsuit. No kidding? Yep. <laughs> so I don't know this. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah, all of it. He gets all of it. Because like, they do not have enough money to, to survive this lawsuit. And wow. so it just takes them out of existence. That's, um, that's super uncomfortable. Like uh, at, on on so many levels, but um, I, I love the vindictiveness. It's like, hilarious. Yeah, that's uh, um, I had no idea. Yeah, um, Anduril is doing a bunch of uh, counter UAS stuff. Okay, cool. Um, Unmanned uh, S. What the hell is the S? Uh, Unmanned aerial system. Got it. Okay, yep. So you. the uh, so counter drone. So the uh, so we're talking about right. Um, so so on the uh, so on the counter drone side, one of the first things that so they're doing drone and counter drone work. So they want to do like large area surveillance as a service, which is great and a good business model. Yep, um, they want to, uh, you know, look for and then basically put flying bricks through uh, through drones that are moving <laughs> in the area. So a uh, kinetic arrest or like whatever. Real, real um, or no, they just like like a quadcopter that's really dense and heavy and, and built better than the other one just flies through the uh, the it's the sacrificial though. It's gonna get destroyed. Um, the uh, sometimes like uh, the videos are pretty impressive. Wow. And um, anyway they um, uh, they're fascinating because they're one of the, the first startups that has um, you know gotten a like a billion dollar IDIQ from Uncle Sam, right? So they made the big time. Everything they else. get a billion dollars from the government to work on that? Well, they have a billion dollar IDIQ. So, so it's, it's an IDIQ? So it's an indefinite duration, indefinite quantity. So it's a task order contract. So it just means you're approved up to a certain amount and the government can just load up mini contracts underneath it, task cool. order order, uh, order jobs. Um, so they're, they're fun to follow. Um, Scale AI, like uh, Scale AI yeah. and uh, um, Scale AI is uh, like really amazing. Right, they've done a lot in. Uh, they're kind of um, an understated hero in commercial AI cool. and you know planning of neural networks and deployment of neural networks and the uh, and they're just starting to branch in the military and government side and I think the the sky's the limit on that That's side awesome. of the house, right? Um, the uh, there's um, um, who else is is fun to follow? There's Those are easiest, like, I'm subscribed to bots that just, like, shove my RSS feed full of their <laughs> their stories. Um, they're, That's awesome. They're quite good. Otherwise, you know, follow Breaking Defense, and they've got all kinds of wild stuff, like, uh, like every every week. Um, Aptronic in uh, Austin, Texas. So we were talking, 
you know, at dinner yeah. about like Austin's emerging hardware scene. So Aptronic. I love Austin. It's the coolest city I've ever been to. It is a very, very cool city. Um, the uh, music is, is uh, phenomenal. Agreed. Um, and the, uh, yeah, so Aptronic is, is a company that's a spin out from the uh, University of Texas. And they started in exoskeletons, and they're moving into uh, and they're moving into manipulators um, and uh, oh, and humanoid okay. robots. Well, that's a market that we've not ever talked about before in another conversation. No, never. We didn't yeah. just talk about like what Sarcos is doing in the space or or, <laughs> or anything else at all. And um, so, Aptronics in that space, um, they're uh, they're really fun to follow because I think because of this the the novelty of how they're going about it and I'll let I'll let the the listeners and viewers jump onto their website and check them out but um the uh you know their CTO who's their former CEO um uh Nick is um uh yeah engineer at heart inventor at heart yeah and sense. uh well, and, and stepped out of the way for uh, Jeff Cardenas to who was who was in charge of uh like business and strategy. So you just get a really good salesperson to back you up. They just flipped, yeah. yeah. And um, um, but the uh, yeah that that team there is um, I can't say enough good things about about the leadership of that company and it's taken off like gangbusters, backed by Grit Ventures, um, and uh, I think they're going to do some uh, some big and exciting things. Awesome. So they've got some uh, they they have they have a couple of interesting contracts with like uh, um, through Army Applications Lab. Which is one of the new labs that emerged when Army Futures Commands got got founded. Um, and Army Futures Command's interesting. It's first first four star, new four star command in forever, and they and they dropped it, the headquarters right there in Austin, Texas, which had no military presence before, very limited, right? Yeah. And uh, well, it sounds like it's growing. And it's growing, and that's and that's a big reason why. Like if you, you know, if if I was starting a defense startup tomorrow and I had no ties or roots anywhere and i'm a pennsylvania native so you know my roots are here um the uh, i'd be i'd be in commuting distance of austin texas yeah like i think austin's great i mean i, I really do love it uh, it's got a good tech scene was raging that's where i took my vacation because i couldn't go you know offshore mm -hmm. I, I like it so much it's a great city i want to go back as soon as humanly possible it's great i mean it's a big leader in like cybersecurity. it's got plenty plenty of just smart software engineers but it does have an emerging hardware scene which is pretty cool i'm a hardware guy so it makes yeah me happy. exactly um the uh yeah the whole scene down there around capital factory um in downtown austin that incubator um, I can't say enough enough good things about like they're they're doing a lot of things right. I would love to see that recreated, you know, here in Pittsburgh. Um, we probably have the makings of it. Like I, I feel like you'd be able to fill something like that. We out. easily have the critical mass. Yeah. Like and I think, um, you know, I think, I think this would basically be the defense version of like. Um, the uh, mass robotics uh master well actually even locally like uh bobby zapala's uh you know ascender Asunder, yeah. right like like i think something like that that you start for defense you start to you know but the problem is we don't have a command near here within driving distance of here and so you know the that's that's a real advantage that austin has right now is like a 24 hour drive to austin <laughs> that's <laughs> a scant yeah um it's they're at a real advantage with a four-star command being there like, yeah, that's uh, awesome. it's a it's a it's a big deal. That's super cool. I, I definitely want to check that out. Should we should we cut it here? This seems like a good spot to end on. Yeah, why not? Yeah, do you, do you want to plug like anything you want to talk about that you're doing or like, oh stuff, no, releases? I'm just having having a great time. Like uh, this website. Um, the uh, it's a terrible website. Don't go to it. Like it's going <laughs> to relaunch in a couple of weeks. Um, the well, uh, I mean, this episode comes out in a couple of weeks because our backlog is pretty stacked right now. Oh yeah, no, I mean uh, anybody anybody that's interested. So. Um, you know, come come check us out at hellbender.com. Um, we are the first uh, technology and manufacturing benefit corporation in uh, in Pennsylvania, which is a little bit of a different thing. And we've got to focus on, you know, open source technology and dual use technology. Um, and uh, you know, we're we're trying to you know bring um, you know, made by hand in China prices to you know edge compute enabled. Um, technology manufacturer here in Western PA. So which is super cool. I've seen your line. It's badass. I mean like, Awesome, thank you. 
well, it's fucking cool. Like you've got some brilliant people working on just an awesome line. Oh, the team's amazing. Yeah. Right. And and, and the the bones of the building you inherited even is is just it's just a perfect story. Yeah. Shout out to U Park. Like um, the University of Pittsburgh Advanced Research Center is a real asset for the region that I think not enough um, entrepreneurs are taking advantage of. The rent is I low. Agree. And I've never a, seen it before I came out to visit you. It's so cheap to be there. Like, don't awesome. don't buy the glass, people. Like, yeah. uh, you know, get get the good cinder block digs, like up in up in U Park. Nice. Put the money where the tech is, and <laughs> uh, you know, keep it on the rent. Well, so. you've got a clean room in there. I mean, oh no, it's it's uh yeah, it's up to date. So we've got we've got an ISO um, um, class five capable, class seven ready to cert clean room. Um, the uh, we've got good good high base space. Um, you know, brilliant loading dock, easy on and off from, uh, from Route 28, 24 hour security, um, dark fiber to the building. Nice. So we are like, you know, clearance ready, like, uh, for, for the site. So That's awesome. if anybody wants to get into defense, like that is absolutely where I would point them to here. Uh, yeah. dude, thank yeah. you for coming on. Hey Come Spencer, on. this was great, man. Thanks so much. Cool. All right. Thank you.